Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of December 5th, 2013. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I am presiding tonight. Um, as per our custom, we're going to open with uh, public comment. Uh, the public is invited to speak on any topic and limit their remarks to three minutes, please. The council is precluded by our rules from responding. So uh, any questions positive will be left unanswered, I'm afraid, at least in the context of this meeting. Um, when I call you up, please come to the podium, state your name and your address, and have at it. And we're going to start with Liz Wynott, who's first. Hi, um, my name's Liz Wynott, and I'm here representing the Tapestry Health Needle Exchange, located at 16 Center Street in downtown Northampton. Um, the first thing I want to say is I want to thank all of the members of the City Council for your continued support of the Tapestry Health Needle Exchange since it opened up 18 years ago. Um, I first want to mention that we're having an anniversary event tomorrow at the Media Education Foundation at the Francis Crow Theater on Masonic Street. And that starts at 6 p.m. We're, we'll be showing uh, different films we've been involved in and there will be a discussion, including remarks by City President Bill Dwight. <laughs> um, and we invite all to attend. So I came here tonight in solidarity with Never Another Death Month and to be witness to this proclamation I know how important this cause is from my work with the Needle Exchange and also from growing up in this city. I've been personally a witness to the direct <laughs> impact that alcohol and drug use has had here. For, uh, for those unfamiliar with what we do, we intend to meet the needs of those in the midst of their addiction and to work with them through a harm reduction framework. We offer HIV, hepatitis C, and STI counseling and testing, overdose prevention and Narcan training, referrals to treatment and ongoing counseling. Abstinence from drugs and alcohol is one of our goals. However, we also realize that addiction is a reality of life for many, and we try our hardest to keep those currently addicted to opiates and other drugs as safe as possible. One issue I just wanted to quickly hi highlight tonight is the rising incidence of hepatitis C among those under 25 years of age. Um, state surveillance from the uh, Mass Department of Public Health in highlighted in um, one of the MMWR reports, has shown that starting in 2002 in Massachusetts, there's been an increase of newly diagnosed hep C infection among youth ages 15 to 25. Um, specifically between 2002 and 2010, which was the most recent data I could find, an increase of 65 to 135 cases per 1,000 population Massachusetts was reported in this age group. And the data suggests that this increase is due to youth injecting drugs, mostly heroin. In my own experience as a local public health professional, I've also seen the same trend. Um, it's too common that someone will come to us uh, barely over the age of 18 and already have hepatitis C. And to me, this indicates significant drug use during teen years. Long-term use and acquisition of a virus, such as hepatitis C, has been shown to increase the risk of a fatal overdose and also transmission of other diseases like HIV. As never, as never Another Death highlights, there needs to be more treatment options for adolescents. It's far too easy for youth to fall through the cracks once they start using drugs, and more attention needs to be given to this issue through advocating for increased treatment, rehabilitation options, and other services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joyce Sabin, please. Hi, I'm Joyce Sabin Resha, 67 West Street, Northampton. And I want to thank the mayor and the city council for this proclamation tonight. We spent the last year working with many others in recovery. We've had many wonderful experiences in this community and other communities. We want to thank Bay State Builders and Dakin for their donation project. Because of this, we were able to post our Heroin Killed Someone I Love bumper sticker on the construction site on Main Street um, from, since September, which gets a lot of traffic flow. Also, the Michael J. Diaz Foundation and Ludlow School System, who sponsored Chris Harone, who's the basketball junkie, on October 28th. He's um, from the book Fall River Dreams and he became a heroin addict. 
We were so privileged to see him tell his story. He's spoken to over 400,000 teenagers crisscrossing the United States. His message was very powerful, honest, and life-changing for me. On September 26, we also were part of um, Recovery Month in Boston at the State House, and hundreds of people were the voices of recovery through more Massachusetts Organization of Addiction and Recovery. And I brought some materials. Um, we heard 15-year-old children take the microphone and share their story and tell that they were one year clean off heroin. And it, <laughs> I cried a lot because I was so proud to see these kids take charge of their lives. Um, my son Matthew died 13 years ago and the programs that these children are enrolled in and are having success in weren't available then. Um, Teen Challenge also is a huge program and they had young sober musicians who performed and uh, they were really incredibly talented and clean and sober. Also there were recovery high schools from the state of Massachusetts there. And I want to thank everyone in the, our community that supports recovery, Harrison House, Grace House, and of course Tapestry because uh, every day Tapestry saves lives and gives people an opportunity to um, be free from disease, um, learn about uh, harm reduction, and make wise choices to be able to live after their disease is arrested. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Francis Crow, please. I'm Francis Crow from Three Langworthy Road in Northampton, and I'm here to talk about the dangers of Vermont Yankee, as uh, there are thousands of spent fuel rods up on the banks of the Connecticut River, very near the river, in Vernon, Vermont, five stories high, there are more spent fuel rods there than were at Fukushima. So if there's a serious storm and anything happens to that building, we have a Fukushima on the eastern coast of the United States. And I feel these should be put in dry cast and stored deep underground not on the floodplain because they have to be vented, but in a mountain in Vermont. And we're only 30 miles from Vermont Yankee. And uh, Energy, the corporation that owns Vermont Yankee, wants to mothball the plant and not do anything with the fuel rods uh, until they say they have more money. But they should, they're they say they're going to operate for 16 more months because they need the money. Well, I think they should shut it down now, but if they continue to operate, I think that money that they make should go in an escrow account to take care of the fuel rods. So um, I hope you will all look at the uh, decommissioning flyer I gave you, and you'll see a picture of the stored of fuel rods standing on the banks of the Connecticut River. And they're there on the banks of the river because spent fuel rods have to be kept cool with water, r running water. And when the plant was um, first authorized, it was that they would have their own cooling system, uh, which they have, but it's cheaper to use the Connecticut River. Uh, to cool the fuel rods. So they put the hot water in the river, and that's why the river hasn't frozen over at Northampton. It did a does at the Oxbow, but, but from Vernon down to here, almost to Springfield, it's still warm. And the fish have been affected by this. So it's an extremely dangerous thing, and I th feel that uh, it's very important that because we're only 30 miles away, we should really be weighing in on that. And there are more people living in western Massachusetts, close to Vermont Yankee, there, than there are in Vermont, almost beyond Montpelier. The population of western Massachusetts is at high risk, I feel. 
So um, Doug Rennick will want to tell you more about the decommissioning <laughs> panel we're having on Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Douglas Rennick, please. Hello, my name is Doug Rennick. I live at 105 Black Birch Trail out in Florence. Uh, and I work with Francis on the Nuclear Free Future Coalition of Western Mass. Uh, the NFF is committed to a nuclear-free, carbon-free future, and we um, envision a renewable energy future. And um, to, to that end, NFF provided the solar coach, uh, Susan Lance, and core volunteers to the successful Solarizing Northampton uh, program that has just been completed. Um, so I'm here today to invite all of you to the event on Sunday. I gave you a copy of this flyer. Um, we'll be at the Bridge Street School uh, on Sunday afternoon uh, between 2 and 4. Uh, and there's more information on the back of the flyer about the, uh, the experts that we've invited to present. So these uh, four people who will present all have experience in decommissioning. And I don't know about you, but this is like a mystery to me. Like, what do they do when these plants shut down? And uh, we know at Yankee Row, all of those leftover fuel rods are still sitting at Yankee Row. Uh, and uh, so I think it's important for us to be aware of what's happening up there. Uh, as Francis said, whether they leave them sitting in these pools or whether they put them in dry casks is a very important public safety, uh, safety issue. Um, so I think she's given you uh, some concerns we have about the possibility of a solution that's called safe store, which means they just, everything sits as it is for 60, 50, 60 years, and then it gets uh, cleaned up into a, like a green field instead of the brown field it is. Um, so these are, these are important things for us to be aware of since we are downwind and downriver from this, uh, from this plant. So we'd like to thank Councilor Jesse Adams and the Committee on Public Safety for co-sponsoring this event. And we'd like to invite all of you to come on Sunday, bring your questions, and ask these experts who've had experience in this decommissioning process what that's going to be like uh, for us living uh, fairly close to the plant. Uh, so there will be a Q&A session after the experts make their presentations. So do come on Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fran Polkman, please. Good evening, I'm Fran Volkman, 40 Arlington Street in Northampton. And I'm here to invite you all, counselors and community members, to a presentation next Wednesday on food and farming in Northampton and the Pioneer Valley. The presentation is sponsored by a local group, Keep Farming Northampton. Some of you have heard about it. We've been working for the last four years to, uh, under the sponsorship of the Agricultural Commission. Uh, to create a picture of our local food system. We've surveyed 26 Northampton farmers, that's most of them, um, 550 Northampton residents, 38 restaurants, and 10 institutions to provide solid data on the place of farming and local food in our economy and our community. This fall, we were joined by students in a capstone course at Smith College on local food who have completed the final survey and placed our work in a regional context, and they've made a fabulous visual presentation. Um, we have recommendations on steps that can be taken to make Northampton a local food destination that supports our farmers, our businesses, and all of the members of our community. The presentation will be held on Wednesday, September 11th. Somebody take a picture of this. Wednesday, September 11th. December. December. I'm sorry, December 11th at 7.30 in the RFK community room. We especially hope that city councilors, city leaders concerned with economic development and sustainability, and uh, many of the survey participants, as well as others, will join us. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Steve Susco, please. Yes, Susco, Steve Susco, 754 Bridge Road, S-U-S-C-O. I attended the two 
public informational stormwater and flood control meetings held this week. I wanted to ask <coughs> a couple of questions without hogging the time. My mind is still open regarding this matter. Although I sat hand raised between the questions of others, essentially the entire meetings, I was not recognized. I believe not recognized on purpose. Why? What are you afraid of here? Others were recognized multiple times. Some apparent favors, favorites, some 10 or more times. I began to ask a first question at the first meeting, but was shouted down by the Ward 3 Counselor Daniels, he extolling the audience to condemn my pretense. Good riddance to the Ward 3 Counselor. Hopefully he will man up and indicate his level of involvement in the railroading of the former Ward 3 representative. How about it? A parting gift, as it were. By the way, this city owes the Plasmans an apology. What's the matter with my questions? Why can't all citizens participate here? Inclusion and transparency, you say? Baloney, I say. I demand that all citizens be allowed to participate in this matter. For, for fellow citizens' notice, I believe these meetings are being conducted with planted questions from the audience. People and claim task force members jumping up and demanding higher and immediate increases to the proposed fees. Persons claiming to be from New Orleans and, in, and equating our situation as equivalent to Hurricane Katrina, baloney. I believe our situation here is being misrepresented by those presenting. We are being told our, our, uh, we are in dire straits, that the levy failure is, in, is, uh, is imminent, baloney. It's past time to cut the baloney. Fellow citizens, I say to you, get interested and involved now or face never-ending and increasing fee payments. And I'd like to read from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers letter to the cities, our city's engineer regarding our flood system's present status. And this letter is from Mr. H. Farrell McMillan, professional engineer, chief of the Engineering and Planning Division and Levy Safety Officer to the Northampton City Engineer. And he writes that the minimally acceptable rating of our flood damage reduction system means that the deficiencies were identified that require attention, none of which would prevent the system performing as intended during the next flood event. And one more sentence, if I may. I am pleased to report that the system should perform as intended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol Reinhardt, please. Good evening. I'm Carol Reinhardt, and I live at 105 Black Birch Trail in Florence. And I come to you this evening as a member of the Human Rights Commission. This is the last time I'll be addressing the council in this capacity. So I'll take this opportunity to thank you for your support and your commitment to human rights and issues in Northampton during my seven years in this role. I've really been proud to be in the role and I've really enjoyed it and working with you. I urge you to continue to take very seriously the role this commission can play in holding up the values and concerns that are as important to our collective life as mending our bridges and attending to our public works. Tonight, the mayor will read a proclamation regarding the 65th anniversary of the passage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'll refer to it as the UDHR. Although the many nations participating in this declaration through the United Nations in 1948, they would not have used this term, but I think of the UDHR as a sustainability plan, a recognition that governments have a choice based on the genocides, the holocausts, and wars of the first half of the 20th century 
those signers knew that governments can indeed ignore and undermine the necessary infrastructure for fostering and nourishing human community, ultimately the only reason governments exist. Or they can support the full survival and rich potential of their greatest resource. The UDHR sets a potential, um, sets a, a template really of basic standards that are necessary to fulfill this element of a government's infrastructure. Basically, its people must have food, shelter, education, safety, and freedom in order to function and grow. We can be tempted to be cynical and disappointed about the level of success reached in the 65 years that have passed. However, to mix my metaphors a moment, I suggest we think of the human rights listed in this declaration as being like wedding vows, essential for a strong marriage and yet destined to be bent, spindled, and mutilated when lived out by the very human community they serve. Yet it is when we drop the vows and give up the hopes and aspirations that real and attainable possibilities are laid waste. Forgive me for talking past the zero up there on the screen. On this coming Tuesday evening, December 10th, some of you counselors will be among the 30 community representatives of human services and justice activities, each one reading one of the 30 articles of this sustainability plan. Professor Josh Miller of the Smith College School of Social Work will be speaking on how each of us can bend the arc toward racial justice. And students of every age will be singing and greeting guests. I hope you will come and encourage your constituents to come as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That's all. Um, folks signed up. If anyone else would like to speak, uh, Frandy, would you like to step up? Hi, I'm Frandy Johnson of 669 West Hampton Road. I'd like to urge that the City Council vote against the CPC's vote to fund the design of proposed Pulaski Park plans at the tune of, to the tune of $194,500. The plans call for turning our only downtown park into an entertainment venue instead of a place for quiet enjoyment. There are hundreds of residents and dozens of stores within earshot of the park. Previous events have rattled windows on buildings and essentially put a stop to conducting business for hours at a time on Upper Main Street. While an occasional concert of non-amplified music is fine, plans for a stage would invite overuse of the park. Furthermore, plans for Pulaski Park are premature until there is a coordinated plan for the roundhouse and lot and the park. I realize that CPA gives the CPA a lot of CPC, a lot of money to spread around, but just because $194,500 is a lot of money is no reason to award the money to the designers who have stated that the money would be pretty much the same regardless of the scope or cost of the final project. The nearly $200,000 design fee would not pay for one shovel full of dirt to be moved. Total cost would be one to $1.5 million, and I'm not sure that's how we should spend our money. Thank you. Thank you. Is so there anyone else would like to speak at this time? Bobby? Hello, my name is Bob McGovern from uh, 14 Masonic Street in Northampton, which is Packard's location. I know I'm probably speaking to the choir on this one, but um, I thought I would uh, uh, come and give you a little overview of what the Mass Restaurant Association thinks of uh, casinos uh, and their effect on surrounding communities. Um, any study that uh, uh, the mayor is looking to do for uh, the effects uh, is, is well worth money spent. Uh, for all the studies that we've looked at, um, Springfield may call it the saving grace, and I call it the nail in the coffin, because it has an economic impact of about 35 miles uh, in a circumference around it. Um, retail, restaurant, disposable income. Uh, the money goes into the hole and it doesn't come out of the hole. Um, 
all roads lead to the casino. So anybody around there, <clears throat> any of the businesses that think they may reap business from the casino, small restaurants, retail, somebody selling mattresses, uh, Bob's in West Springfield, uh, anything gets affected by the income that's sucked out of the people by the by the uh, casinos. And the casinos, uh, I think it's uh, Wynn, Mike Wynn, the uh, developer, big one of the biggest casino developers, say anything around the casino, the, the money goes in the casino, it doesn't leave. And when people leave, they don't go somewhere else and spend the money because they don't have any. So any money well, is well spent on the study. We don't want to see the effects of a casino up here in, uh, in Northampton. And if there is one in Springfield, um, it'll be devastating to anything around it, uh, including us. So uh, I would urge you to support whatever the mayor has to say about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak at this time? Going once, going twice. All right, we will convene. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Here. 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 There are no public hearings scheduled, so uh, we go directly to the communications from the mayor. was a parcel of communications actually <laughs> good evening honorable members of the City Council um, I have uh, two uh, proclamations that I'd like to uh, issue this evening um, the first one is entitled human rights day December 10th 2013 whereas Tuesday December 10th 2013 marks the 65th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights signed by the United Nations General Assembly following the defeat of fascist expansionism and genocide. And whereas all people share fundamental rights based solely on their common humanity. And whereas, as stated in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, quote, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world." Unquote. And whereas the city of Northampton has long held a prominent place in American history for our community's support of peace, social justice, and human rights, and whereas the city's formation of our Human Rights Commission is the tangible expression of our support for human rights, and whereas the primary responsibility to promote respect for those rights and freedoms lies with each individual of this nation, and each of us can play a major role in enhancing human rights. And whereas on December 10th, 2013, in observance of Human Rights Day 2013, it's in our hands, community members will come together to publicly declare their support of humanity's hopes as expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And whereas this proclamation is sponsored by the City Council Committee on Social Services and Veterans Affairs, chaired by Councilor Marianne Labarge, now therefore I, Mayor David Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim December 10th, 2013, to be Human Rights Day in the City of Northampton. I invite our community to affirm and protect the human rights of all people as set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights so that these rights will flourish and be made available to all. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the city seal this fifth day of December in the year 2013. And I would be honored to present this to the chair of the Human Rights Commission. Um, I have a second proclamation uh, this evening, uh, and this is um, uh, entitled uh, Never Another Death Month, December 2013. Whereas organizers dedicate Never Another Death Month to the memory of all adolescents and adults who have died as a direct result of alcohol and drug use, 
And whereas many youths have died of alcohol and drug-related causes due to a lack of appropriate and available treatment facilities in Western Massachusetts, and whereas there is a critical need for an adolescent alternative rehabilitation and treatment facility in Western Massachusetts that acknowledges the unique challenge of working with adolescents in a multi-service approach to rehabilitation and treatment, and whereas rehabilitation and treatment with supportive counseling and life skills training presents a positive alternative to the death and incarceration of the growing population of youth addicted to drugs and alcohol. And whereas organizers would like to acknowledge the dedication and work of the staff of Hairston House, Grace House, and Tapestry Harm Reduction, as well as the work of the Northampton Prevention Coalition, a community-driven effort to raise awareness of these issues. It is important to acknowledge the recovery community who share their experience, strength, and hope with those struggling from the disease of addiction. And whereas never another death seeks to raise awareness of the problem of drug and alcohol addiction on behalf of the families who have lost their sons and daughters, brothers, sisters, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and friends. Now, therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim December 2013 as never another death month in the city of Northampton. I encourage residents to support those who counsel, house, and employ individuals in recovery and to remember our neighbors who have been lost to drug and alcohol addiction and all those who remain at risk. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and fixed the seal of the city of Northampton this fifth day of December 2013. And I would be uh, honored to present this to uh, Ms. Resha, who's Thank brought you. this forward. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Uh, and I believe um, that completes the formal communications that I have uh, this evening. Thank you for sharing both of those. You're welcome. I did have just one other piece of news. I know we did send this out to city councilors um, in a press release uh, from Senator Rosenberg yesterday. But I just wanted to formally indicate um, that the, um, the governor uh, yesterday in a um, cap in sort of a capital improvement plan that he reduced for the state included a very important uh, release of funds for a, an item that was included in the 2012 transportation bond bill, uh, specifically $3 million that were allocated to a project in the Meadows neighborhoods uh, of Ward 3 here in the city to focus on stormwater and drainage improvements uh, that would not only help uh, residential homes and properties in that neighborhood, but would also assist in the ongoing uh, redevelopment efforts at the three county fair. So I just wanted to publicly thank the governor, uh, thank the Secretary of Administration and Finance, as well as especially thanking Senator Stan Rosenberg and, S and Representative Peter Cocott for their strong advocacy on behalf of the city of Northampton. And we'll have more details on this project as it moves forward. So. Thank you for that. Thank enough. you. Um, we have uh, before us now. We have a, a resolution here. This is upon the recommendation of the Northampton City Council. Whereas the citizens of Northampton hold the military service of its sons and daughters in the highest esteem, and whereas Northampton's veterans have given much of themselves in the service of us all and inspire in us an enormous sense of gratitude. Whereas men and women who have served in the armed forces from this community have suffered wounds and have died in conflicts throughout our long history. And whereas our community has a proud tradition of military service, and many of our citizens have earned the meritorious combat decoration of the Purple Heart Medal that is bestowed upon those who, quote, are wounded by an, an instrument of war in the hands of the enemy and posthumously to the next of kin in the name of those who are killed in action or die of wounds received in action, close quote. Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council hereby proclaim the city of Northampton to be a Purple Heart community, honoring the service and sacrifice of our nation's men and women in uniform who are wounded or killed by the enemy while protecting the liberties and freedoms enjoyed by our community. I'll accept a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion on this? Councilor Tacey? Um, I'm not going to get into a word, uh, a word game, but enjoyed by our community. This, uh, we're not an island in, in the Purple Heart um, Association, and 
I would much rather see it uh, as in 22 others that I've read by all Americans rather than just by our community. You want to amend uh, the... Uh, I'd like to amend it where it says, enjoyed by our community, enjoyed by all Americans. By all Americans. Um, Bob, these are medals that are nationwide. Right. So it's a, there's a second on the Thank you. amendment. Any discussion on the amended language? All those in favor of amending the language to say, uh, by all Americans? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Any other discussion on this? Yeah. Uh, Thank you for putting sure. this together. Sure. I spoke with Leo Agnew, the commander of this, and uh, he sent me an enormous amount of information and all kinds of stuff on it. And um, I want to thank you for putting it together. The uh, the original letter that he sent out is, uh, and I hope that we'll have the mayor proclaim this when it comes, I believe August 7th is a day that's set aside <clears throat> as recognizing um, people who have earned the Purple Heart in the course of their service of this country and, uh, and come August 7th, when it's warmer, we will hopefully uh, have an opportunity of the mayor proclaim that day of Purple Heart uh, uh, Commemoration Day. Um, this is, as you, as you pointed out, uh, Commander Agnew had asked that we uh, consider being a Purple Heart community like many others in the surrounding area, and um, I think this is wholly appropriate, personally. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Any abstentions? The resolution as amended. As amended. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, any actually one minute announcements? <laughs> Councilor Daisy? I just <clears throat> want to make note of that the world has suffered a severe loss today with the loss of Nelson Mandela. Not just in Africa, but he, on the world stage, a champion of human rights, and um, it is a, this is a severe blow to the entire to the planet. And um, I wanted to make um, just make that that announcement. Also, <clears throat> a little closer to home, we lost a uh, a veteran last week, um, a couple years older than myself. Uh, died in the center of Florence in his apartment. Stephen O'Connor, Vietnam veteran. Uh, U.S. Marine Corps, also uh, National Guard, and um, from a fabulous um, family, a family local, been here all his life, um, and a friend of mine, and it's a disaster. Um, another, another veteran has passed, so thank you. Uh, Council LaBarge. Thank you. Um, just to remind all the counselors, please mark your calendars. The Human Rights Day celebration, a call to action, December 10th at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Unitarian Society in Northampton. Announcer, Council Freeman Daniels. This is from the uh, DPW Reuse Committee. There's a holiday toy exchange happening this Friday and Saturday, 5 to 8 Friday, 8 to 9 a.m. on Saturday in the parking lot of the Northampton Senior Center. Uh, on Con Street, um, bring toys, exchange toys, um, adults, uh, parents only, please. Um, and uh, you can find out more on the DPW's website. But uh, it's this Friday, 5 to 8 in the evening, and Saturday, 8 to 9 in the morning. to toy exchange. <clears throat> Councilor Tracy. Yeah, I want to thank Carol Reinhardt for all of her work that she's done for this council and all the times I've worked with her on many different levels. And she outstanding advocate for human rights and uh, it's funny that we had read this proclamation about human rights on the day that Nelson Mandela had passed and Carol Reinhardt delivers her last I'm not trying to put right. the two together uh, but it's true it's just uh, it's pretty ironic I think and um, thank you karma thank you any other announcements um, it's uh, Mary was about to smack me on the back of the head, but fortunately and said she gave me this to remind me that um, uh, given that this is the uh, season where appeals go out for charity, um, there is a phenomenon here in the Valley known as Valley Gives, and that is if you're inclined to donate to any charity, uh, local charity, um, if you do so on uh, December 12th or 12-12-13, as it's noted, 
you'll give them an opportunity if uh, based on their sponsorship they have the opportunity to win two hundred thousand dollars more as it were for their for the nonprofits and charities that serve the community and as we know there are a lot of worthy organizations here and if you want if if you really want to make your uh, your donations count at this point sign up for it if you go to www.valleygivesday.org uh, you have an opportunity to sign up for that and and be part of that and last year was it was epic it actually it generated a lot of money for uh, valley nonprofits, social service agencies and the like and um, but you know see what we can do to make it epic again 12 12 13 December 12th this year <laughs> for those of you marking your calendars thank you very much uh, any other announcements okay we have a fireworks permit uh, the application I believe Penny Burke is here there's Penny um, you want to blow up the garage no. <laughs> <laughs> <Is that what? laughs> okay. All right, well, that would solve some problems, but if you, okay, you do what you want to do. This is, uh... I'm Penny Burke. I'm the Executive Director of Northampton Center for the Arts, and I'm here to uh, request a permit for fireworks on uh, first night, December 31st, 2013, 6.15 p.m., from the roof of the parking garage. No, no intent to blow it up. Uh, th this is an annual event that uh, actually has become a landmark event, and it's it's stellar. I don't um, any questions about this about the chance to look at the license. Uh, this has been done. I'm sorry. I'll accept a motion. I move to Second. Right. <coughs> uh, motion's been made. Any further discussion? Nope. Council Freeman Dan. Uh, I just want to. I'm supportive of the permit. I just want to say. Um, that uh, the Commission on Transportation and Parking has uh, unanimously uh, voted to allow uh, free parking on New Year's Eve, um, and uh, so in support of First Night. And um, so uh, we hope that uh, people can watch the fireworks without fear of uh, being ticketed. Just don't park on the top floor. <laughs> right. Well, actually, there is not free parking in the garage. <laughs> There's right. free parking it's a, in the Armory right, Street lot. Municipal lots, lots but right. yes. Thank you, Transportation and Parking Commission. On behalf of everybody who wants to come to the event, it's much appreciated. And, the, and this occurs rain or shine? Well, New Year's Eve. Oh, you mean the fireworks? Right. Rain, shine, it's snow. The, f the fire department really makes a final okay. call in uh, the t 11 years I've done it. We've never had it canceled. It really it mostly depends upon possibly rain or wind but fingers crossed it's gonna i've happen. seen it in the snow it's actually stunning it's beautiful it's stunning all right all those in favor of granting this permit please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions thank you thank you light up the garage <laughs> light up the um, <laughs> uh the uh approval minutes move to approve Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And with an abstention. Uh, now we're up to the reports of committees and appointments and elections. Uh, we have the minutes from transportation and parking. Uh, two sets of minutes, right? We have. Um, September 17th and October 15th. Move to approve September 17th and October 15th. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Now we're going to recess for finance. I'm passing the gavel to Council Murphy, figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing sharp. No Nothing way. sharp. No pointy <laughs> objects. That's the big mouths. Yes, sir. <laughs> We're recessing for uh, the Finance Committee. Council Murphy is the chair of that. So, Mary, would you call the roll of finance, please? Council Murphy. Here. Council Here. Council Here. Council Tyson. Here. Until I do that, I don't get any paper. Yeah, I know. That's right. It's a, the tea ceremony. So, so the first item, on the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, for that 
$74,573.38 be appropriated from the Smith Vocational Stabilization Fund for the purpose of purchasing computers, Chromebooks, iPads, and other technology to upgrade computer labs and classrooms to meet curriculum and software requirements. Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. okay, and the mayor is here to tell us about it. Uh, yes, good evening, counselors. Um, this is actually uh, the funds in question is actually some uh, residual funds that have been in a um, in an account, a stabilization or sale of land account uh, that came about as a result of the sale of some land to Cooley Dickens Hospital several years ago. And so the trustees, of which I'm a member of the Board of Trustees, um, had these uh, these capital-related needs, um, particularly in the, in the technology department. And uh, so the Board unanimously voted to uh, uh, utilize these funds uh, for these capital purchases. Um, and, and even though it is a, um, because it's a stabilization fund, it requires a vote of the city council to actually uh, make that sort of an appropriation. So um, I agreed to bring it to the city council and make that request. Councilor Tacey. Yeah, and this is a portion of that of that fund. And how much is left in that fund? This would actually be the this the balance. This of is it. the balance of what was remaining. I believe that there was some capital um, work done at the time uh, of the actual sale. Um, but uh, but this was a fund. This this is the this would actually close out the account, um, which is another reason for wanting to for them wanting to do it. That was a, like it was a million dollars, wasn't it? I believe it was in that neighborhood, and I believe that that some of the um, proceeds were used immediate more immediately for for capital needs um, at the school. Um, this is just a lot uh, the, res the residuals of it that's been sitting in this account. And, uh, I, and I so think it's a great use of the funds. I just mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Adams, how, how many are these expected to buy? How many computers, Chromebooks, iPads, and other? Uh, I do not. I do not have that specific information for you. Um, uh, although I could. Um, well, I guess I should say that um, kind of like sort of how we work with the school committee on these items. Uh, the trustees, like the school committee, um, you know, have this have, have sort of detail. Uh, line item spending authority over how funds are spent in the, in the Smith Vogue budget as well as the school budget. Um, so uh, I don't have that level of, of detail for this order, um, but it's something that their new IT director has recommended and the superintendent has recommended. Um, but generally for these type, this is more of a, these are funds that already reside in the Smith Vogue budget, they just need authorization to move it from one area to another. So I don't really have the line item detail. Yes, sir, Dwayne. Uh, is it limited to hardware, or does it also include CAD systems, software, things of that nature? That it's uh, there's it's a combination of hardware and then some software related to curriculum as well in their computer labs. Um, they're needing to do some updates to their. They also, you may remember earlier this year, we came before you um, to get authorization for an ex extended lease to purchase a new student information system. So they've been, like, like the Northampton Public Schools, have been undergoing um, a lot of work uh, in this area. And in, uh, it's, not, um, it's, co it's not coincidental that, that the, uh, a lot of our new testing protocols are now going to be moving to a computer-based protocol. Um, so uh, the kinds of MCAS testing that we now do uh, with paper tests are now going to be moving to a computer-based format. So many school districts are, or at least those who've had deferred investments in technology, are now uh, really working to make sure that they have that capacity. Um, and we're doing the same. You may recall on, on NPS, we're in the middle of a three-year, you know, three hundred thousand dollar investment in our school technology on the on the Northampton Public School side. So. I, I personally feel better if the money were invested in the education as opposed to the testing personally, but that mm -hmm. I don't have a say in that. So, yeah. well, it'll be it'll certainly get more use than just for the testing. <coughs> but um, these these upgrades are needed to their computer labs in part to be able to accommodate the testing. Councilor Tacy, so this is just for the labs and classrooms. This has nothing to do with administrative use. Uh, yeah, this is from the um, this is from the. Uh, this is from their IT department, 
and the uh, and it's and it's basically these are needed to upgrade the computer labs and classrooms. So this is all hardware that will be used within the um, within classrooms and computer labs. It's not an iPad for staff. So it's it's focused on on students. That's correct. Okay, thank you. that the need is also present in every one of the shops that right. are there at the school just because in all aspects of industry mm -hmm. technology is more and more present and for those students to be prepared being able to ha use those in that capacity um, iPads uh, mm -hmm. other technologies essential so I'm completely in support of this any other questions on this one all right, then uh, those in favor of a positive recommendation to council? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Uh, and this one upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, order that the amount of $22,000 be appropriated from the stabilization fund allowing the city of Northampton to contract with an independent consulting firm to perform an economic impact analysis of the proposed MGM Springfield Casino and its potential negative impacts on local retail, entertainment, and service establishments within the city of Northampton. A motion on this one? Okay. Second. 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 Well, all kinds of support for this one. Second to the whole committee. So. Uh, questions, uh, the mayor want to tell us more about this one? Yeah, if I may. Um, so uh, uh, we've been uh, following, tracking very closely the, uh, the licensure process in the Commonwealth uh, for this new industry that uh, that uh, we are, um, not, I wouldn't say we, uh, I wouldn't associate myself with it, but the state government is, um, is creating in casino gambling, uh, and in particular the licensure of one uh, resort casino in western Massachusetts. And so um, as part of that process, we've been trying to, f to follow it. We've had conversations with some of the um, license, uh, potential license applicants, uh, namely Mohegan Sun and MGM. Um, now that the field has cleared and it's no longer four or five and now just one, we've intensified those conversations. Uh, we have, uh, a couple of months ago, we retained legal counsel to help us with those negotiations. Um, and as part of uh, either helping with those negotiations or the potential of going to the Gaming Commission uh, to seek status as a impacted surrounding community, I feel it's incumbent upon the city to, uh, to commission an impact study uh, to be able to provide us with hard data on those potential impacts. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about um, some of the more uh, you know, expected um, impacts uh, of a community that's right next door to a community that, has, that may have a casino, traffic, uh, you know, public safety, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but as I continue to try to point out in the criteria laid out by the Gaming Commission, yes, there are those kinds of impacts uh, that, that one would expect um, for an abutting community. There's also another category of impacts that are spelled out um, in the legislation, which I've actually uh, included in the resolution, and that is potential negative impacts on local, retail, entertainment, and service establishments in the affected community. Um, and I believe that uh, we've worked very hard in Northampton uh, to create a very strong local-based economy, uh, with, which has a strong emphasis on uh, retail, entertainment, and service establishments. And so I've been greatly concerned about the prospect of a casino located in western Massachusetts in essentially the same economic market as Northampton about the potential impacts. Um, to date, uh, MGM uh, has not been receptive to those uh, conversations, uh, and uh, and so I fully expect that when the deadline tolls on January th on December 31st, uh, that we will need to avail ourselves of the next step in the process, which is to petition the Gaming Commission directly uh, for. Uh, impacted uh, surrounding community status. So I believe it's important that we have the data uh, to be able to make a presentation to the Gaming Commission. And so that's why I'm requesting uh, that this amount of 22,000 be appropriated from the stabilization fund to be able to fund a study. Uh, we've sought and received uh, uh, request, uh, uh, proposals from about seven or eight different firms who are qualified to do this work. 
uh, which we've done through our, our legal counsel. Um, we've narrowed it down. This funding would allow us to um, immediately engage uh, one, or one of, of, the, uh, of the two to three finalists for that. Um, I would add that while I'm asking the city council to put this money forward to allow me to move forward with this study, I also fully intend in January uh, to submit to the Gaming Commission. Um, there's a separate process which allow communities to seek reimbursement for expenses related to this surrounding community process, including legal fees and including um, economic studies and other research. So I fully intend to do that. Uh, in addition, I've also been in conversations with uh, the local business community, some, one of whom you've heard from this evening, um, who share the concerns that I have about these potential impacts, and they are very supportive of such a study, and I've been receiving financial commitments from members of the business community, including the Chamber, including the Business Improvement District, um, including Iron Horse Entertainment Group, and others um, who are willing to help contribute to this to help defray the cost if, in fact, we are not able to get reimbursement <coughs> from the state or from MGM uh, for this study. So I apologize that, uh, that it's sort of coming forward late in the game, but this has been a very strange game for communities to play. Um, up until, you know, two or three months ago, um, it was very difficult to know whom you were supposed to be negotiating with. Were you supposed to negotiate with Hard Rock, uh, MGM, uh, Mohegan, Ameristar, Penn <laughs> National. Uh, and so really, it's clarified now to this one potential licensee. Um, and now the sort of the game is afoot, if you will. To, yesterday, uh, MGM announced that they had reached their very first surrounding community agreement with the town of Ludlow. Uh, and the town of Ludlow has agreed to, first of all, I believe it's $50,000 reimbursement from MGM for similar economic impact studies and legal costs, as well as I think an annual payment of, about, of I think it's $75,000 a year. Um, I know that they're in uh, negotiations with other uh, communities in and around Springfield, um, and the goal, of course, is to try to get those negotiations completed by December 31st so that they can submit an application um, that contains as many of these types of agreements as possible. Um, so that's sort of the lay of the land, and so that's why I believe it's important for us to move quickly, and I would seek the Council's permission to move forward on this, and that's why I'm seeking this funding authorization. Councilor Dwight. The mitigation that the now first of all the state clearly acknowledges that there's an impact and for some reason they don't look at it say as a nuclear meltdown that it seems to stop at borders and that the impacts don't really radiate much beyond that but the the my concern is, is of course mitigation fees are merely they go to the community they go to the city or the municipality or the town they don't go to the business owners who clearly will be stressed by the loss of of um, patron pool the diminished patron pool would actually impact the businesses and if those businesses fail particularly in this community or say London seventy five thousand dollars doesn't get you a lot when all is said and done it, it it basically doesn't sustain the community which is what we rely we rely on all these industries this to make this community work it makes perfect I'm I'm glad that we're doing this study I do wish we had it in hand to begin with. I wish we had it to start so that we, I mean, because the the timeline that w that's prescribed is so narrow, at it's such a, a a really bad time of year to actually get anything done. Or you know the it's it's I'm I'm really disturbed at the f of the fact that the, this is sort of uh, shrugged off that somehow Northampton would not be impacted or that Northampton's uh, just wants a taste of this rich casino wealth that's coming down the pike. I would much rather not see the casino. I would much prefer that. And any mitigation that comes is not going to compensate at all for the, our, our sense of place. It doesn't come close. You don't buy that. And I'm sure that I, I think casinos function, they're a corporate system. They're designed to generate revenue and money for their corporation and for their investors. We're a community system. We're a system that's designed to sustain a community and what we value in a community. And we run across purposes. And the state has decided to sanction 
a casino, a for-profit industry, and give it essentially a non-competitive zone, protection from competition anywhere other than the locally owned businesses who don't enjoy that protection. And I can't, I actually fully expect this report is going to reveal all the things that I believe we all know in our heart of hearts is true, that the casino uses entertainment and food and drink as a loss leader. They don't make their money on that. If they did, they would have come here years ago and set up in Springfield as, a, as the glamorous MGM restaurant bar entertainment emporium. They're here for the gambling. <clears throat> the gambling, it's, and, I, and I, I, I wrote recently that their purpose is to work it as a bug light. You attract the patronage pool and you keep them there. You don't let them go outside. They stay on campus and they invest their money there. And so they're going to offer you meals and drinks at a much cheaper rate. They're going to poach from our own businesses here in this community. They're going to take restaurants that, have, that might have some success here and put them there. But that revenue doesn't come back to the community. It does not come back to Northampton by any means. And we don't get those customers back. I, I think $22,000 is a very small investment to at least prove to the state in some way beyond screaming at them, which I've been doing for a while, but to prove and document what we all believe to be true and real here. If I could just respond to that before. Um, uh, just like I think that we are one of the only communities that is unique and that we fit into that, that category of, of really, you know, we are kind of the entertainment and cultural hub for Western Mass, I think it, we, we could craft a creative agreement. Um, with them that could that wouldn't just be a payment to the city for example it could include um there, there's a i think there are creative ways to do it um to help uh, uh provide funding around marketing and tourism and and uh and, and talk about some of the concerns we have about our entertainment venues um, i think there's ways that we can do that but of course to date we haven't uh, been able to even get a conversation started um so so Again, that I think I think, um, and again, I think we we all know it, we all you know feel it. But um, standing before the gaming commission, we're going to need a little bit more than a feeling, uh, and so we need we really need to have this data to be able to submit to them as part of our application. So, in a high stakes game, we're coming loaded for penny ante, <laughs> poke pick up poker, and we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of forces to bring to bear here, except possibly this report. Uh, we have the report, and we have, I believe, we have the language of the law that we. That do we, we have legislative report uh, 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 support? Do we have is is uh, Rep. Cocott and and Senator Sam Rosenberg? Um, I, I I do not. I, I haven't actually had an opportunity to discuss this with them. I mean, this is kind of a regulatory process that I'm not sure legislators are necessarily going to wade into. Um, but the legislators put us here. They've already this done their job. Yeah, I think yeah, they already weighed true. in. I think uh, this I is think true. But, Both those um, legislators have actually voted in favor of this, yes. and I, I think to some to some extent uh, we, uh, at least if they weighed in and chimed in, or at least gave us some recommendations mm -hmm. here on how we approach this, I don't think that's inappropriate for them to. We can certainly do that. I just would add that this is a, the commission that's been appointed is an independent commission, right. um, independent of the legislature, independent of the executive, and has very uh, strong authority and power so um, we'll have to make the case to them as well so I think Councillor LaBarge Councillor LaBarge is thank ready you. thank you um, I agree with this um, I think this is something that we need to look at very seriously um, I think are you asking for two votes I am. tonight I am Mayor? asking I, that didn't quite get it onto the agenda but I, I obviously um, I, again, as I said, if I get the authorization, we'll be engaging someone immediately and beginning work. Because I am very concerned knowing how many small businesses we have in the city, going through a recession, and then having a casino coming, which is really neighbors to us. I'd like to know, Mayor, I mean, we're not going to have control of what the gambling commission makes a decision where they're going to go ahead and who allows to go to springfield if mgm does go there my question is whatever we do with this independent study 
you then would go to them and say, this is what is going to happen to our city, this is what's going to happen to our small businesses or whatever in the city. All right, so you do do that. What do you do if they say, okay, we will give you so much money a year, how would you distribute that money? Um, I, I really, I'm not sure that I um, feel it's appropriate for me to talk about that um, now, because I feel like that's part of a negotiation that we have to have oh, with okay. them, and I. Um, but I mean, would it that money be used to help businesses in this city? If most definitely, this would be. I mean, this is an Im economic impact. We're not making an argument that that um, that the casino is going to tax our water system or going to tax our you know is going to put a strain on our traffic system. This is purely about our our local economy, okay. and so any sort of an, ag an agreement that we crafted would be geared towards um, mitigating. And again, I, I want to be clear, I, I, this is not about uh, you know Northampton versus Springfield. I no, but it's understand. a neighbor, and it, it why, is an impact. I understand why Springfield's pursuing this. I've talked to their mayor about it. Um, he understands why I'm doing what I'm doing to protect my city. And, um, but again, the law was very clear, and, and assurances were made uh, to communities that, uh, you know, community impacts and mitigation were going to be a part of this whole licensure framework. And so, you know, we're going to avail ourselves of that. Well, so. I want to thank you as our mayor for doing what you're doing and moving on this quickly. And this needs to be done definitely. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Yeah. It, the, the, the state recognizes impacts, a litany of impacts in all communities for these. They, they actually recognize it. They've, said there isn't going to be an impact. And every, every study, um, all through Maine, uh, Atlantic City, they all talk about the impact in the surrounding community from these casinos. And I see, of course, I see the word negative here, and, I, and I, I'm glad that it says potential negative impacts because there's really no positive impacts as far as I'm, I'm not a big supporter of casinos. I'm not really a supporter of taking 22,000 bucks out of the stabilization fund that's already crippled, I think. Um, but I think it's probably going to be money that will be uh, well spent. But do you think the study is going to say anything different than every other study that's been done on this? I think the difficulty... And, and, and how much clout will this study have in our presentation to the state? Um, Again, I'd, uh, I'm trying to, I don't hate to use a gambling metaphor, trying to keep my cards close to the vest here. Um, but I, um, I don't want you to show me your I, I don't believe there's been any studies done um, by MGM related to these sorts of impacts. Um, so uh, at least in the Pioneer Valley and particularly, you know, Northampton vis-a-vis -vis Springfield. So, um, uh, so, you know, to the extent that uh, we provide information to the commission that's relevant to our specific argument, I think, th I think it's incumbent upon us to do that. I, I don't think we can stand before them and say, you know, we have arts and retail and entertainment. What we really want to be able to do is drill down into the numbers about, mm -hmm. you know, discretionary income and looking at median incomes and looking at spending patterns. And, and these firms that we're talking with um, do these kinds of studies all around the country, they do them for they do them for casinos, they do them for for communities. They have access to databases and um, economic numbers, um, and they're able to really drill down and be able to look at what are potential impacts: hotel room <laughs> occupancy, uh, you know, spending in restaurants uh, using uh, you know using the kinds of data that Mr. McGovern was talking about that trade associations compile. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, looking at things like, you know, meals tax and sales tax, which we have a lot of really good local specific data around. Um, these are all data points that we'll be able to take a look at. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I think it's important that we really provide them with something that's really focused on Northampton. I, I intend to support this. I just try to wrap my head around whether or not it's going to be and again, believe me, I wish I wasn't having to, to dip into our stabilization account. I wish we weren't having to deal with this issue. I'm not a supporter of casino gaming. I'd rather spend my time working with the state on projects like 
the governor announced yesterday, which is going to create, you know, it's going to give funding for communities to create infrastructure that's going to help support, you know, real local and regional economic development. Um, those are the kinds of projects I'd like to work with the state on. Um, but, but yeah. along with supporting this, I will also support the financial commitments of uh, local businesses that might want to help out with this study. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, they and they understand how important this is as well. Councilor Adams, I support this order. I just have a couple of questions. Um, you stated that the city hired an attorney specializing in the casino industry to negotiate a community agreement, and that those negotiations didn't really get us very far. Is that uh, so um, I've had uh, I have had I had meetings with representatives from MGM myself, uh, official for, with officials. Of, Officials from MGM, officials from Mohegan Sun were the two primary folks that I've had uh, meetings with. Um, somewhat, uh, you know, very formal, preliminary types of discussions about uh, different issues. Um, we then, as we moved into the latter stages of the process, uh, because of the fairly strict requirements and timelines, uh, we really wanted to make sure that we had the best advice around how to navigate the process and making sure we were doing everything we needed to do to, uh, to follow the law. And so um, part of that was, you know, formalizing our, our request and negoti for negotiations through, you know, legal correspondence and communication between our lawyer and MGM's lawyer. Um, so that was the decision to engage. And that, and in fact, uh, the, uh, our legal counsel will in fact, so the way the process works at, before the Gaming Commission is when we, uh, after the deadline tolls on December 31st, we have 10 days to file uh, for this, um, file directly with them for, for com uh, surrounding community status. They'll then essentially have a, um, the Gaming Commission will then hold a hearing. And we know this because um, and our council knows this because they've already done, sort of done this process on the slots licensing, um, which is the earlier process that they've already done. And so essentially the way it's worked is um, it sort of, it's, it probably would remind you of like an appellate argument before, a, before an appellate court. You know, each side gets 10 minutes or 15 minutes basically to make their argument and submit briefs. Um, and so, uh, so that will be the forum in which we will have um, not only our legal counsel uh, making um, arguments on behalf of the city, but then this particular consulting firm that we will be hiring to make a presentation as well. Um, and then obviously the licensee will have an opportunity to make a presentation. Then the way the process works is that if um, uh, the, uh, essentially there's a 30 day arbitration process that's, that can go into effect if that's what the MGM, if that's what the gaming commission decides where essentially they give us 30 days, the party's 30 days to, uh, try to mediate, uh, uh, a, um, a solution. Um, and then ultimately the, the gaming commission can make a decision. Um, so it's a very, uh, a fairly, uh, tightly, uh, regulated system. Um, it's a little bit of uncharted waters, although we've, we've sort of seen how the process has worked in the slots licensing. Um, but that's why we, uh, we believed it was important. And, and council we're working with has worked, uh, is representing other surrounding communities um, in Massachusetts. Uh, and so that's why we made that decision. Um, are, they, are they paid at the same rate as our city solicitor? Uh, in this case, um, uh, in this case, they are not. Um, and, uh, and in part because of the short time frame of the work and because of the fact that we are um, going to be seeking uh, reimbursement, um, this is sort of the format that we're following. So we are paying them a slightly higher fee because of the specialized nature of the work. And, and hopefully we can be reimbursed, but not necessarily though, correct? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You're correct. Um, again, I hate to keep coming back to these metaphors, but we're obviously gambling a bit here, um, but I believe again, it's incumbent upon us not to gamble with, uh, with allowing this to proceed without, without advocating for, for Northampton and potential impacts. Um, how, how, how much, if, if you want to say, and if you don't, that's fine too. The entities that said they'd help offset this 22,000, to what extent are they contributing? Uh, again, so far we've just had verbal discussions. 
Um, and, and again, this is uh, just over the last couple of days, so there's obviously going to be more discussions and more, and more talk. Um, but uh, trying to do some quick math in my head, uh, I think right now we are about at, I think, five to 6,000 has been committed. Um, no, will they get reimbursed if we get reimbursed? Well, I, I think the way, and I don't want to get into too much of this, um, or I, I don't want to speculate too much about it, but clearly, um, if we move forward and go through the reimbursement process um, and the city's reimbursed, then that would probably, uh, that would be one thing. But in this case, if, I, I think we would see that as a way to help defray those costs if, in fact, we weren't um, reimbursed, um, uh, not to then create a situation where there's six or seven or eight or nine different people filing for reimbursement. I think it makes, it's, makes more sense for us to put the money up front for the study um, and then um, and then seek reimbursement. Um, but again, I, 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 these are strong commitments from the chamber, from the bid, and some from individual business owners as well. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Question from it's actually a question from ignorance. What's the process by which a uh, mitigation agreement is? I mean, obviously the mayor you negotiate it for the city. Mm -hmm. Does the council approve it? Is it just signed? Uh, I think after you negotiated, I mean, how, how does that work? Yeah, I think actually that's a. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten that far. Um, I'd have to. Um, I'd have to th think about that. Obviously, had I worked with them to come up with an agreement, uh, I would certainly. It would be my intent to bring it back to the city council to uh, to you know, inform you of it and seek your 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 approval of it. I believe that's the process. At least that was the process with the host community. Oh. Um, I don't know the. I'll, I'll have to get back to you with a specific answer on that. Uh, on the exact procedure. Yeah. Well, it, as I just wanted to know. I mean, so far as you know, the council will be able to see the agreement and ha and be able to. I would. I would. It would be my obviously my intent to consult with the council on this definitely. Um, or maybe a committee of the council or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing I, I want to echo what uh, Councillor um, Labarge said. Um, you know, th this study is a. Almost, it is in certain respects a double-edged sword. I mean, it will also be, well, it should also be uh, informative mm -hmm. about um, the kind of mitigation we're looking for and mm -hmm. where that, <clears throat> where those funds or those uh, or those resources be, are allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just I hope that uh, it doesn't say it in the order, but I hope that that, uh, that the um, you use the data not only to make the case that that this that this city will be affected because it will. Uh, but also that the particular elements of the city are addressed. The, the particular elements we expect to be affected are addressed in the in the uh, mitigation um, agreement. Thank you. Most mm -hmm. definitely. Any other first-time comments from here before we go back to our council president? No? Councilor Dwight. Um, the one thing that I think, regardless, e even if we don't get mitigation, this report will prove to be valuable as we try to figure out how we as a community, if we are going to get mitigation, how we're going to address the problems and the challenges that we're going to be facing. At least it's, it, it will define the landscape for us and we'll see what we're up against. So in that respect, it's a, it's a, it's a thoughtful investment and um, even if it doesn't succeed in, in swaying the commission. Um, there's one other thing that when, when gambling was certified and in, in, in casino gambling was authorized and certified here in the state, at the time the argument was, of course, that money was draining out to uh, Connecticut, vast quantities, this huge gushing flow of uh, money. And the idea was that when they established these um, casinos that it would retain the money that's flowing out to Connecticut at the same time the uh, expand uh, and attract money from Vermont and New Hampshire and New York. Well, right now, New Hampshire and New York are both uh, about to approve casinos, which then means that the catchment area for this casino that's now going, looks like it might happen, is much smaller. It's reduced to principally the Pioneer Valley. It's not going to go out to East because the whatever casino gets a sep the two other casinos get established in the east are going to grab that group. So all the only people they're going to try to appeal to are the people that Northampton relies on for our our resources and our our sense of places. I said so. Even if that report doesn't 
sway them. I hope it does. I hope it does. But it, we will have that and we'll have a sense of where the discretionary dollars are coming from, how they migrate, and what we can hopefully do in, in, in trying to offset the impacts that those will, that we'll surely realize. Councillor LaMarche. Another concern I have is I think with Mohegan Sun, at one point, the selectmen and selectwoman from Palmer also were invited to the casino. They had some kind of a conference going on where that part of government was involved. Would we be doing that also, being involved with any kind of mediation that's going on? Or well, just you yourself, Mayor? In the case of the Board of Selectmen, they are the executive for, for a town. Um, so that's why the Board of Selectmen would be dealing with it that way. So in the communities where it's a mayor form of government, it's the mayor that's traditionally involved in those, uh, in those negotiations. So okay. that's the difference between Palmer. And I can assure you I won't be taking any trips to any MGM. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't think so. Yeah. Councilor Tacey? Yeah, I want to caution everybody and remind everybody, too, the last two commitments for reimbursement from the state one being the arson spree and the well they never materialized either so well i i too want want to comment about this because i i know casinos very well i worked out of them for many 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 years and i think mr mcgovern's analogy of a black hole is very very accurate for what casinos do they draw in money but only to the casino and they not only draw in money from outside the state potentially, but they draw in money from the neighborhoods and the communities where the casino is and from the, the, the casinos around there. I mean, you've heard me speak disparagingly about our great and general court before, but this is probably the most despicable thing the state has ever foisted on us, the legislature and the governor, because this is the greatest form of aggressive taxation you can come up with. This hurts the most vulnerable members of our community. This hurts the people that no legislature, legislator in Massachusetts would ever vote for a tax this regressive, but they bring us casinos, and it kills these people. It hurts families, the most vulnerable families. It hurts small businesses in the area. Um, always the most vulnerable people. The only reason the state went for this is because they feel they're going to profit share in this, but frankly, every dollar they collect they're going to end up spending to solve the collateral damage that these places cause. Because the casinos don't solve the community problems and the family problems and the business problems and the crime problems. The state has to do that, and it's going to suck up every dime they end up getting from this in the long run. And even Springfield, I mean, they have to, I think, try and fiddle around with provisions of Proposition 2 in the levy ceiling to even collect this money. Because I think they're like bashing into their levy ceiling under Proposition 2 now. So even though they're greedy about it, they got to get some special relief from Proposition 2 to even take the money, the tax money from the casino. The, you know, the whole thing is unsustainably insane. You know, so I'm happy to support this. But, I mean, there's been a failure at any level of government that thinks that the profit sharing that they're going to get out of this is going to be worth the damage that they're going to have to try and fix in their communities in the long run. I mean, anyone who doesn't believe that should take a trip down to Atlantic City and walk, don't walk a block away from the casino because you'll be murdered probably. But it's, it doesn't take much looking around to tell the problems that this is going to cause in, in the long run. And I'm, I'm going to a meeting in Las Vegas next week, you know, <laughs> a mecca of this kind of stuff. And uh, that community is, you know, a unique place, but it should really stay that way. You know, people should have to voluntarily fly into the middle of the stinking desert to do this sort of thing because there's nothing else there to destroy. But here, it's going to be a terrible thing in the long run, and it's very short-sighted by the governor and the legislature to have gone down this road and, and tempted municipal government to do the same. It's awful. Sorry. So what I'm, you're saying is... I'm pretty is, adamant about this. What you're saying is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Is that what well, you're saying? Well, <laughs> well and in Atlantic City, perhaps. Um, but it's... It, it's, it's a terrible thing, and, and whatever mitigation we get from them is going to be a drop in the bucket to what it does to our communities, our most vulnerable citizens, and our small businesses. It's a, a terrible, terrible decision that was made well, well beyond our level, but it, it's a scary thing. Councillor? Uh, yeah. 
I, I intend to support this. And uh, th there's really nothing good about a casino as far as I'm concerned. It's all negative. And uh, I'm not, I, I, I don't support casinos in any way, <coughs> shape, or form. But uh, I'm happy to support this. And I'd just like to call a question. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comment? So all in favor of a positive, Aye. positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. You're welcome. This is a long one. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that, whereas the Northampton Community Conservation Commission submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funds for an ecological assessment of open space and whereas the project will develop a plan to be approved by the Conservation Commission that will allow for effective management of Northampton's open spaces protecting habitat and biodiversity whereas the project meets the goals of the Northampton sustainability plan and open space recreation and multi-use trail plans and whereas on November 20th 2013 the Northampton Community Preservation Commission voted unanimously to recommend that $30,000 in Community Preve Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $30,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act, fund, uh, Act funding to the Conservation Commission for the Northampton Ecological Assessment and Open Space Plan and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, 30000 is appropriated from the CPA budget reserves for this purpose. Move to recommend. Right. Second. And uh, we have Ms. LaValle here tonight. Move to recognize Sarah LaValle. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so as you know, the Conservation Commission has been really, really great at acquiring open space, as you know from all the time we've seen Wayne here um, asking for approval to go after priority open space purchases. But something that's a little more difficult uh, has been effective management of, this, of these areas and prioritizing what we should do and what's best for the environment and things that we should, we should tackle first and what's really a priority. So the Community Preservation Committee felt that this was a really important project to allow the Conservation Commission to do that. Any uh, questions, uh, Councillor? <laughs> we don't have a plan. We do not, not currently. No. We continue to <laughs> absorb space by hundreds of acres. Well, I think twenty-three percent of the land mass of the city of Northampton is now conservation or protected in some way. So what? And we're, and we're looking at more to take on tonight. So what, we the, don't have a plan. what the city does have is an open space and recreation plan, which has overarching goals for how we should be managing our land. But as far as the nitty gritty details of how we should do that, how do we control invasive species? What are the threats? What are the opportunities? We're, the commission doesn't really know how to do that now. <laughs> I'll let that go. <laughs> Council of for now. Sarah, I have concerns here about the open space and with the land that we have been buying at the meeting that we had just recently on allowing hunters to hunt on conservation land it was brought up by several residents and especially like on sylvester road area with sawmill hills and that that when people are walking the trails now here we've bought property but they are saying that there is nothing being marked on what the city owns versus private property and private property owners are complaining about how the city is not doing surveying and marking the property that the city owns so will this be included that will not. That's a separate issue that's being addressed um, by conservation areas. So we're currently working on surveying and, and marking all of the on property all the, the city. properties that we've bought throughout the we city. Are, we are currently None of them on that, have yes. been surveyed. That, so when you're making trails, when you're doing the trails, there are not property lines. Many of our conservation areas have been posted, and, when, and when? most of them have been surveyed. But we're, we're working they? on filling those and, gaps. And they have the property lines set up. 
You can see the stakes. N not all of them do, but all of the new acquisitions, we include that as part of the Because that the is purchase, really important. We're working on going back retroactively. Okay, but I'm just that. saying that's really important, Sarah. Yes, we agree. Because people are complaining about it. Mm -hmm. Thank o you. Other uh, questions? Councillor Carney? Um, just to be clear, Sarah, so this is actually, um, we're talking about a plan that will be for effective management, as it says here, for being able to, as you mentioned, determine um, the level of invasive species and biological and habitat um, considerations. Yes. So exactly. this is kind of the nitty gritty that you referred to um, as opposed to the overarching open space and recreation plan that we do have in the city and I think to which Councillor Tacey might have been referring when he was asking about whether we have a plan, an open space plan, because I've heard it referenced many times in, um, in many different capacities. So I just want us to be clear that there is an open space and recreation yes, plan. Yes, absolutely. So this would be a more guides detailed us, assessment. And this is detailed about the habitat management of habitat and ecological considerations on that land. Yeah, and this would be by conservation area. So we could see, for example, at Fitzgerald Lake, what are, what are the threats that invasive species are posing to our native habitats and how should we be addressing them? And, and the same in every area. Is it mostly about um, uh, plant life and that type of thing? Or there is, uh, you mentioned also habitat. So does this, as Councilor Labarge mentioned, does this have any impact in the current discussion about the hunting and? It, it could potentially if our consultant decides that you know one particular area has a, a particular concern with deer that there there's a lot of overgrazing and they're damaging the habitat but it, it, that may not come up but at it's all. really just a way of generating data and getting information about those particulars on these pieces yes. of land okay, thanks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other comments uh, before Councillor Tacey anyone over here before we go back to oh, yes, sir. yeah but I, I continue to hear all the time as we go through these different blocks of land that we that we uh, acquire about wildlife corridors and uh, invasive plant. I mean, I've heard this all before on every one of these, um, these purchases or these acquisitions. And I really am astounded that there isn't a, a plan for management. I just assumed that as we continue to take all of this, and, that, and then when I look at more that we're going to again take tonight or purchase or acquire, it just um, it strikes me as odd. Well, what the commission does now is they, they go after big problems. For example, at the, uh, the quarry at Mineral Hill, there was a tremendous problem with invasive species, and some funding became available. So we tackled the problems there, but sort of just piecemeal as funding becomes available. And we don't have an overarching plan for how to, do, how to deal with that. So I would think that before we would continue to, we would come up with a plan, a management plan, before we can take any more land. Yeah. yeah that, you manage so what we have already. If, well, let's, if you're telling us that we don't even know if we can manage what we have or, or, or how are we going to go about it? Well, it's managing for ecological health. Okay, thank so you. So we, we just want to okay. make sure that we're doing that as, as best as we can. Yeah, I think we're, we're getting confused in terms here, and maybe that's the language in which this is drafted. Mm. Maybe that's part of the confusion. A management plan, is, there's varying degrees of management plan, and the original management plan, the plan, the, current, the overarching management plan that Councilor Carney referred to is the one that deals with acquisition, it deals with management, um, issues that are more meta. Am I safe in assuming that? They're, they're uh, the deal with the more, and this is one that addresses, as you described it, the nitty gritty this is a management plan that, that allows you the flexibility to be more proactive or less than reactive, as you're describing? Yes, exactly. And this would also be an update of a plan that was done about 20 years ago of the city's open space at that time, which has been incredibly valuable for the commission, but is obviously now out of date. Right. There's, there's, there's been substantial land acquisition since then. And, and uh, and then not to mention other variables like climate change and other things that might that might precipitate a need for this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other on this one? Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the uh, conservation land. Uh, tell me about the land that's where the conservation restriction is held by um, uh, the Broadbrook Coalition or something. I mean, they. they 
do this kind of ecological management themselves sometimes. Is that correct? Broadmoor Coalition is incredibly active in dealing with invasive species, so happily that's that's one area where we wouldn't really have as many problems to deal with. Um, but some areas there really hasn't been much habitat management of any kind over the years. Can I follow? Can I follow? Um, so conservation land that's owned by the city but held by other <coughs> other groups this would also fall under this yes under absolutely this okay it, it wouldn't include um land on which the city holds a conservation restriction though so it would only be the city's land yes not land that's privately owned that yes. the city holds the city but it, this could potentially work um work to generate some goals and objectives for private landowners to use as well i see so um that's interesting. Uh, I mean, how much more would it be just to do the one to, to also include the ones that the city uh, holds the CRs for? Um, well, we don't we don't really know at this point. Um, this is just sort of a, a baseline figure to allow us to hire a consultant to do some really detailed work, but including additional areas we're not really sure about. But adjacent landowners could certainly use the recommendations to manage their own property as well. But isn't it, when the city holds a CR, isn't it the case that they have to that the city is in charge of the assessment and that the property owner is in charge of the actual man the actual uh, management the generally actual when the city holds a CR we're just ensuring that the land is permanently protected forever um, so the owner does both the ma the assessment and the management in almost all cases yes a, a CR can have affirmative responsibilities for the city I can't think of any off the top of my head on, on which we have responsibilities in addition to ensuring the land is protected wow um so the city really can't even the city's not even responsible for figuring out whether land that is is a conserved ha is being uh overrun by invasives or is as in degraded ecological health that's correct okay so this is a drop in the bucket is what you're telling me well, it's not a drop in the bucket. The commission does have a considerable, a considerable amount of protected open space. Okay. And a lot of our, our <coughs> conservation restriction partners would, would be incredibly interested in, in using this plan to manage their own property as well. It's, in some cases, it's just that they don't really know what the issues are. Any other questions on this one? All right. Then all those in favor of a positive recommendation say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Not choosing the vote at all? <laughs> I'm going to say no. All right. I'm we'll sure we'll, we'll speak about it again at council. We'll speak about it again at council. All right. Uh, the next one is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Order that. Whereas Home City Housing submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding for the rehabilitation of 22. That's not the next one. Oh, the next one's uh, oh, on your uh, uh, Central Rail. Let's see. Central Rail Trail. Rail Trail. There we go. All right. We'll stay on the list. It begins the same. Whereas the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a CPA application for design and construction of a multi-use trail from Leeds to Williamsburg, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan and Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan, and whereas the project serves more than one CPA program area, and whereas CPA funds will be used as a match for federal land and water conservation fund grants, and whereas on November 20th, 2013, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $250,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used in support of this project, and whereas at least one public meeting shall be held prior to the creation of construction documents to allow the public input on design of the project, including but not limited to input on the finished surface of the rail trail and on ways to minimize the removal of trees and other vegetation during construction. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $250,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability for the Nowatic Mass Central Rail Trail Extension Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. 
specifically that 250,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve for this purpose. Motion. Move, move to recommend. Second. Second. Comment. Councillor Adams. Um, the order doesn't state uh, the amount of of trail to be extended. So, um, but it's but it's the the chair of the C the community preservation committee does state in his memorandum that's 0.85. But I, I thought I, I I did read a different. Um, different number in the newspaper is it 0.85 it is it's 0.85 in total so there's two different segments the part that's covered by the federal land and water conservation fund grant is owned by the city um, and the other portion is um, we only have an easement over so that's not eligible for those funds but the two combined are 0.85 miles the two combined are yes so wh what are they individually uh, it's I think it's 0.35 and a half a mile or thereabouts Seven, something like that. Yeah. It was pretty odd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions or comments? Uh, Councilor Brett? It's Is it a quarter of a million dollars for less than a mile of uh, bike trail that further gets us closer and closer to someday perhaps Williamsburg deciding that they would like to be part of this rail trail? But that's not the going rate, I hope, for. Uh, uh, for uh, $250,000 a mile to uh, to extend a rail trail. This is about on par with past yeah. past costs. And about. this is doing the crushed stone uh, as opposed to the pavement. This um, is that's why the uh, the whereas clause is in there requiring the, uh, the planning office to hold a, a public meeting because that that's not really determined at this point, and the committee didn't want to make that call, and they wanted the neighbors to be involved. Because it's it's crushed stone. Leeds Trail there. It's crushed stone currently, currently. and then it turns to dirt after that. And, and, and one of the questions is if, uh, if this is a paved surface, this uh, will somehow figure into uh, stormwater management and as well, perhaps? No? <laughs> <laughs> it's, so yeah. the, it, the proposed ordinance exempts. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, other comment? Yeah. Um, anybody for uh, Councilor Tacey? No, go ahead. It's almost to the penny per foot. Um, yeah. This number. Other questions? Where, where is this stretch relative to the bridge? So this stretch includes the bridge. Is is where? This includes the bridge, thought, and yeah. we'll go to the Williams. Okay. Hotel. So this goes over the bridge. It does. It yes. goes over the bridge that's already been funded to be taken care of. The arch. Yes. Yeah, the arch. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other comment on this one? Then. Yeah. What, oh, there was no transportation grant money in this. There was not, no. So these funds will only be used if the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund grant is received, um, and that will be the local match there, and also the, the money to fund the additional portion of trail that isn't covered by the grant. And if the grant isn't received, the, this will be returned to the CPA. And, and s still no movement in Williamsburg yet? They, ha they have a Greenway Committee, and they, they've made a lot of progress over the last few years, and they, when we're working closely with them, with them, and they have a lot of support in that community now. Does any of this take into consideration anything with our park and ride facility and things such as that? Is all this part of a? I mean, it's part of the larger Greenway rail trail vision, but it's not specifically tied to the park and ride number. Okay. So just to be clear, this is a quarter of a million dollars invested to dead end the bike path. Uh, it, it won't be dead ending. A rail trail. It won't be dead ending. It, we are hoping to connect to roads in Williamsburg. But, but currently, there, um, there's right-of-way disputes on the Williamsburg side, um, as I recall, anyway. And so, essentially, settled. Um, mm -hmm. people in Northampton will not be invited to bike beyond that point. I that believe those are in the process of... It's in negotiations, yeah. but it's been negotiations for almost 20 years now. So. But the, I, I just I would just want to point out that unlike a bridge to nowhere, this is a bike path that will end at that point, and we're 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 doing up to the terminus. Now, aren't the right of way connections <coughs> in Williamsburg beyond the point where this is going to enter Williamsburg? I believe that I think they're yeah. further up the line. So there are some issues with connecting further on towards right, Hayden but Hill, doesn't this get you? At least to uh, Fairfield Avenue. 
Yeah, yeah. to there. So you can leave the end of the bike path and yep. keep going. Because mm -hmm. I think it's the other side of Route 9 up that they're having all the right of way problems, but not this will get you at least onto some public way in Williamsburg, I think. It won't get you onto Route 9. No, it won't get you that far, but it gets you. It's a Fairfield Avenue, and then that's and that you can 900 think. feet to Route 9. Yeah. Right, and then you have to double back and switch back and then and get on Route 9 that way. But as opposed to getting on Route 9 where that would naturally access where the rail trail or the rail line actually went all the way through yep. and um, if the properties were not in dispute. But it doesn't leave you at a stone wall. You know, you no. Can, no, you can turn around. Yeah. You to across the railroad. Across the railroad. Across the railroad. My only, my only point being, perhaps I'm being too cute, but uh, when we've had a lot of disputed um, uh, purchases and acquisitions along the lines that, uh, that have been less clear with more, more solid objectives, we've had resistance. In this case, we are not. And I actually agree with the principle. I think it's right. I think it's just. I think the rail trail is is a very appropriate network and system to have for the city, and I think it's an asset. And to that end, I would have I wouldn't dispute this, but I just like you know to compare it to other projects, uh, the Greenway, for instance, or something along that line, which is also is wholly appropriate, and that I was very much for and still am. That th there seems to be uh, there's a pick and choose resistance, and I'm not sure what the what the criteria are. Mm -hmm. Councilor Spector. I just want to clarify, Councilor Dwight talked about this just dead ending at property that's that's privately owned. Does it, are there properties that it would go through whether there is a dispute about those properties or not, or does it end at a street itself? This I'm just not at a street. Okay, so that's very different. I just want, as, as somebody who bikes the trails, and this happens all over where you're, the trail ends somewhere, but you're on a street which I just didn't want to have the impression that it ends and you're at a property owner's house and all you can then do is turn around. Um, so that's, that's very On different. this one, you can actually turn before it on, on Fairfield and get down, mm -hmm. but it does, it would, ex it, the Northampton line actually, you, you, there, it, it, there is basically a stop right there. Not so, nothing blocking so, your way other than. But there is a street right there. There is. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It goes about 400 feet, I think, beyond Fairfield Avenue. Okay. Yeah, I think I know exactly. Pat Fair. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, were you? Uh, Emma, the, the no. land swap, yeah. <coughs> so, if we're done with this one, uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now, in a strange sense of deja vu, on the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that whereas Home City Housing submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the rehabilitation of 2224 New South Street and whereas the project ensures that 18 units of affordably restricted housing downtown uh, that is harmonious with the surrounding community will continue to be available and whereas the project will result in the restoration of an important structure in the downtown national historic register and whereas on November 20th 2013 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $250,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that 250000 be appropriated from the Community Preser Act, Preservation Act funds to the 2234 New South Street Apartment Restoration Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the Council. Specifically, that $161,126 is appropriated from the CPA Historic Preservation Reserve account the $26,374 uh, is from the CPA budgeted reserve, and $62,500 is from the affordable housing reserve account. Move to recommend. Second. Comments? Questions? Uh, Council LaVarge. Um, I support this. I think just hearing from in social services and veterans affairs from housing partnership of the necessity of keeping affordable housing here in the city. And I can recall way back when we went and redid that section over before, and I think, Counselor, you were involved with other counselors with us on that. This is a project that we really need to look at, we really need to support this, and there is a significant um, character of that housing 
that's very valuable for the city of Northampton. I'm going to support this because of the affordability, and we need this, and it needs to be taken care of. Councilor Tacey. I'd have to ask the, the mayor, I know he's recognized, the 165000 excuse me, $130,000 that was in the settlement agreement, wasn't that for renovation? It was a, for a combination of renovation for the hotel, a combination of renovation and um, affordability. And my, my question is, it seems to me that this place gets rehabbed quite often. Research that I, I can't quote that off the top of my head. There was some funding uh, that was uh, part of that agreement, um, as well as I believe I believe there were some more recent um, the, not, I don't want to call them negotiations, but some settlement around it when the, when the land was transferred um, to the current owner um, that set resolved some of those issues and also expand expanded the affordability restriction that was part of the agreement. So. Um, I, I don't really, I can't, I'd have to do some research on that for you, Councillor. Yeah, that I, predated my administration, so I'd have to look into that. Okay. So I'm just kind of curious as to how many times it, we will put money into this, this building and how much has gone into it so far. I mean, it just seems like the hotel was just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think I've seen it renovated three times. I did it once myself. I'm just, I'm just kind of curious as to why it needs to be renovated again and what, what, the, what the issues are. Councilor Dwight? Um, the, the unique feature of this particular property is that it is the only system for affordable housing currently in the downtown area of Northampton. Northampton is different from a lot of other communities where um, the people of, of, with needs um, do not live in the downtown core that they're in Northampton's kind of strange they're more or less relegated to projects that were developed uh, post-war to the periphery off bus lines in some cases and have no access this is this is an affordable housing complex that actually is 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 critical and as the case with all housing projects that provide housing for section 8 vouchers among others um, I think it's in, and also given the fact that the city's uh, preference to keep the downtown area from appearing blighted, um, that we that any commitment that we have to maintain systems and the services in, in, a, in a state that, that um, the community considers appropriate and certainly the people who live there consider appropriate and, and amenable, I think it's all to the good. Councilor Speck? Yeah, um, just a little quick math. On, and <clears throat> Council, you know, doing uh, the kind of work you do that can be very costly. And these 18 units, if you divide that $250,000 up, we're talking about $13,900 per unit, which doesn't go very far in terms of renovations. So, you know, you're talking $13,000 for a unit. I'm not sure what the work is. But it doesn't Neither seem like it doesn't right. seem like a huge amount of money. And, and the hotel uh, piece was quite a few years ago. So, you know, $250,000 and we're talking about 18 units and this is a rather large structure, you know, is not a great amount of money to do renovations and, and they're going to come up all the, you know, perhaps every few years. So. Uh, Councilor Adams. I, I support this project completely, but um, this order is outstandingly vague. <laughs> Um, I mean, it really is. This could use some detail. If you could please relay that to the drafters. I mean, this just tells us very little. And the, the, there is a little more detail in the, in the um, CPC chairs, uh, the chair of the CPC's definition or uh, explanation on, on the, on the, in his memorandum. But this tells us very little. And we really should know more about this order. I, I agree with that. I mean, actually, in the narrative, it says this project includes siding and trim replacement painting and other uh, work needed to secure the building envelope. Um, and I think, I think at least for purposes for our deliberation, uh, you know, more detail explaining. I don't think we necessarily need the line items, but I think we need no scope of work anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I believe I echo that. Um, I really do appreciate the uh, um, memo from the uh, chair, but I, I think that um, future CP uh, 
a grant um, should include the um, uh, the uh, list of conditions uh, that the uh, that the CPC um, places on the grantees uh, with the order that that the council sees. Uh, the council accepts those conditions. Um, I don't and I don't think can amend them, but uh, at least the council can, should and could see them. I think with every single order that the CPC uh, asks us to approve. Thank you. Yeah, I, I won't support it because it just it is too vague. There is nothing, and I don't. I'm looking about future uh, ones, I'm looking at this one right here, um, and I'm not. I anyway, vote any way you want, but I, I won't support it until I know a little more about where the money's going and what it's going to do. Thank you, Councilor Dwight. You, uh, um, no, I'll I could just any other. If I could just echo, uh, I agree with Councilor Freeman Daniels about if if these orders could state the conditions, I think that would be. Uh, even more helpful for clarification. Thank you. If I may, I just just a comment that um, we just passed the rail trail one with <laughs> the same paucity of uh, of information without any discussion, exactly. and then on the other ones, we're now you. Um, I'm concerned that suddenly they don't quite meet the qual the quality. I, I agree. I absolutely agree with. Uh, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels' proposal, I think that would be very helpful, but I also don't think it, um, the absence of information in this case actually warrants a no vote. But, I mean, because that same absence exists for the Norwatic rail trail extension. So if that's the case, then all these should receive no votes, mm -hmm. because the, that applies to every single one of these appeals, I mean, these appropriations. But I'm going to give everyone a yes vote. Because I believe that I know that this has been thoroughly vetted, and I and I would personally like to see more reflection of what that looks like. But at the same time, I don't know. It's the it's it's that disparity that concerns me. Councilor Casey. Yeah. Um, on the rail trail, I know exactly. And we all know exactly what goes into that. They're going to cut some trees, put some gravel in, and they're going to do a type of type of paved surface. Period. We know that. You don't know anything about this. You don't know what's going to be done, so that is that. So you're not even comparing apples to apples. Thank you, Thank Councilor Stephen Daniels. I um, I agree and disagree with uh, Councilor Dwight. I, I mean, I agree that I um, I think we both agree that the CPC uh, takes its job very seriously. Um, it uh, it is um, a good body for oversight. It uh, typically lays down uh, significant conditions. Um, it, sure, there's always there's always a mistake uh, or you know a, uh, a a project that's funded that uh, the community sometimes members of the community don't always agree with but um, I think that the in general um, they come up with good projects and uh, I've been generally pleased to support them uh, so I, I don't think the process is is poor but I, I do think that the council would be bet would be very well informed uh, to uh, to see um, more detail especially the conditions and the um, that are put on the grantees and and I actually I was able to go into the uh, website uh, today and uh, and look at at, at these um, at some of the some of the um, questions and answers and so on and so forth and and there is it's it's actually a wealth of information so it's not it, it, it's not like it's unavailable um, but uh, it also is um, following following trying to get information in municipal government is very difficult so I think it would be very valuable to actually just put it instead of Having a link to the website actually just put okay. it in the order. We don't. Do That's that. exactly what I was going to say. So, uh, Councilor Carney, did you want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have any comment on this. I, I intend to support this, um, and I, I'm. I don't feel like I need to have the details of what will be in each of these 18 units um, uh, that are uh, single, single occupancy, uh, and we know that that doesn't make up. All, I, I'm prepared to support this this evening. Based on the recommendation from the CPC. Did Doug? Yeah, counselors. I just want to. I just want to add my support of this project, and uh, happy to have more information in front of the council. I have certainly no objection with that, um, since it exists. So it's just literally about packaging, and um, and I do think that um, the project is tremendously valuable to us as a community um, in support of affordable housing and wanting to have it be in the condition that we all think it should be in. So I, I think it's an excellent sort of use of CPA funds. 
um, Ms. Lavalley, did when when this were you there when this was presented at CPC? I was. Yes. Did they they never at any point identified exactly how much money has been put into this building, have they? Uh, they gave, they did give an overview and they outlined some of the issues that they've had in the past. Um, the renovations that were done, I think about 10 years ago, included resetting the building on its foundation, which was a really significant unanticipated expense. And the, that project was initially supposed to include all of this work, but the, the foundation issue just ate up a lot of those funds, As, unfortunately. You know, a historical, it's one, one, I have a very good historical perspective on this because uh, Claire Higgins and I were on the housing partnership like 20 years ago before she was even elected to anything when John Dunn submitted the voodoo development plan for this place. I mean, it is a nasty old wood frame building. And it's the second black hole to be on our agenda tonight. You know, the, the vagueness doesn't matter because this is probably the most high maintenance building you can try to do affordable housing in. It doesn't matter that it's vague because about every 10 years, you're gonna to have to pour $250,000 into this place. Yes, it was falling off its foundation. It was 20 years ago. Um, it's always going to need this kind of injection of funding until it either falls over or burns down. I mean, it's a really high maintenance, tough building to do this kind of housing in. So, I mean, I, yeah, I worry. It's a little bit vague, but it really doesn't matter because this, this structure, um, the way it's constructed, is just going to always be a money pit forever. So, it's, it's a tough thing. So it, it's a historical building. If it's off its foundation, you actually have two things. You have a historical building and a historical foundation. So that's, you know, that's a it's good It's historical <laughs> all the way down to the ground. And, and these are the people that did sue us, you know, for some of this money. So some of it we give to them and some of them they sue us for. But the flow shall never cease. Councillor Adams, you'll be around longer than I will, but sometime in the next 20 years in city government, you're going to be giving them another two hundred fifty thousand dollars because this thing this is just a tough old wood frame building that's going to suck money forever. You know, it's just Jesse. what it is. So be in charge. <laughs> and just re regarding the the vagueness of the orders, these are based upon the, the committee's evaluation of the the applications, which were in most cases really very extensive, and those are all available online and, and referenced through these orders. Um, but if there's a, if you have any concerns, I'd be happy to, to take this back and revise it if you wanted to table your vote today. Any other? Uh, oh, Councilor yeah, Casey. I'm really familiar with the building falling down. You needed climbing gear to get from one end of the kitchen to the other. For years, the kitchens, the floors were so bad. Um, and Larry sold it to oil, and oil jacked up one end of it, and then it went to Tiagno and the MHIC and several other agencies since then, and they've all thrown money into it, including the city of Northampton over the years. So, but it would have been helpful to have said maybe we're going to do bathrooms or something was wrong with the place inside or something. It would have been helpful. This is only for exterior work. So this is, this is only to do the yeah. things that are listed. In, that was, and that was what the money from the, uh, the settlement was, too. I thought it was for roof and siding. But that's all right. Um, I'll support it, but I would like to see more detail in the future. Um, on these requests. All right, any other discussion on this one? Then all in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm going to say nay because I didn't support it 20 years ago and it still doesn't make sense. So I, in the interest of continuity, I'll say no. All right. <coughs> Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that whereas the Northampton Board of Public Works submitted an application for Community Present Act Preservation Act funding um, for a fund for the preparation of design plans and construction documents for the renovation of Pulaski Park. Whereas Pulaski Park is an important downtown resource and the project will build upon existing work and public process to rehabilitate the park as well as inclusion of additional public input. And whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan and the Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Plans and whereas on November 20th 2013, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted 6 to 2 to recommend that $194,500 in CPA funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $194,500 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Pulaski Park Renovation Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. 
specifically that $194,500 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Motion? Correct. Second. Second. All right. Discussion on this one. Councillor Tacey. I'd like to table this until we find out what we're going to do with the lot out behind this block on South Street. Because I don't have a clue as to what this is going to turn out to be. And I don't think anybody on this council does. We don't have a magic ball here. And the $194,500 is a lot of money for design work, I think, on a park that is really not substantially larger than the park in Florence. Um, I know that that might not be apples to apples, but it just seems like we have we have distinction. We have specifics uh, in Florence, and here you don't even know what's going to happen in this park. We haven't got a clue. So you made a motion to continue to, to table time this specific until, indefinitely until we figure out what we're going to do with the lot. So is that behind? Definitely yes. Indefinitely. Right. Is there a second for that on finance? Hearing none, uh, other, because we're in finance, so yes. this is the finance um, Other questions or comments? Yes, I do. Point? I've had Counselor, the yeah, cancel the question. I would like to ask Sarah, because I did call me today in regards on the voting on the commission. It was six to two. What were the reasons why the other two? Sure. Um, and just one point of clarification, too. The mayor was also an applicant for this project. The, um, the Board of Public Works and the DPW Primary, primary oversight for the funds with the mayor was also happening. Could, um, but regarding the the vote, down to a member, every single committee member agreed that this project is extremely important and wanted to get the ball rolling on renovations to this incredibly important piece of the downtown. However, the vote wasn't unanimous because some of the committee members thought it would have been more appropriate to separate the design and public input process and then the preparation of construction documents into two separate projects. So that, that was the disparity. It wasn't that they didn't support the, the renovation or didn't want this to That's be done. If the mayor, who's recognized, if I could ask the mayor a question. Sure. I'd just like to get your input on the statement, which uh, does make some sense to me. About this came up uh, extensively. Um, I appeared before the CPA committee in support of this project. Um, and in fact, we, um, we received a letter, which I, I don't think you would have gotten unless you got the application uh, the full application, but um, Tim Love from Util um, has been, who's our consultant that's working on the Roundhouse lot project, has been very clear that he believes strongly that, this, that, first of all, the initial design work that's already begun on Pulaski Park is excellent, and he has encouraged the city to continue moving forward with that, and he actually submitted a letter to me um, uh, echoing that in terms of this particular application. Um, I think one of the criticisms of the, of, um, or some of the criticism that came out um, during the, uh, uh, during, you know, earlier roundhouse lot redevelopment, the earlier project was that the um, development was going to drive what was happening in the park. And um, we really started from a perspective, and, and Mr. Love, who's the urban designer, really started from a perspective that the park should drive the development, not vice versa. Mm. Um, so he doesn't believe that the city should stop this process. Um, he reviewed the Stimson drawings, actually incorporated them into his presentation when he did the public presentation. Um, so he was very supportive of that. Thank you. I can also speak to the, if I could, to the question Councillor Tacey raised, because this came up too about the price tag of this particular park. Um, this is an urban park. Uh, it's, uh, and, and interestingly, there's actually a, a, a significant urban park restoration program going on throughout the Commonwealth, primarily focused on gateway communities. Um, but I can tell you that Veterans uh, Park in Holyoke was just renovated, very similar size park, uh, acreage wise, same sort of thing, sidewalks, monuments, uh, grass, um, uh, $1.4 million was the price tag. Uh, Fitchburg uh, just did their gateway park, I think it was $1.5 million. Um, so these are estimates that are in line with these kinds of uh, parks um, that we're seeing around the Commonwealth. Um, and again, we not only have the earlier Nancy Denig study, um, I was actually on that as Ward 4 counselor, I was on that original, the first Pulaski Park uh, redesign committee as Ward 4 counselor where we worked with Nancy Denig. Um, she 
produced a great design. Um, then the design process was reopened, and it was basically open to the public. Any, it was sort of a free, open design competition that both citizens and professionals could submit designs to. And it's taken several years, and now we've gotten to this stage where the BPW advanced this Stimson concept. Um, and I can also say that Mr. Love strongly endorsed Stimson as a design firm uh, who, you know, one of the top design firms in the nation. So they, they would be an excellent person to work with. And then the final point, of course, is we came up with all those great designs, but we could never do anything with them because the CPA law present, prevented us from, from doing what we're doing, trying to do tonight, which is spend CPA dollars on an existing park. The original law only let you spend it on new parks, building new parks, and it's only when it was amended in the last year or so that we're now actually be able to come back to you and say, we can actually fix up a park that already exists. So I'm a strong supporter of this, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I don't believe waiting for the roundhouse uh, process um, is merited here. Um, thank you. Uh, I also um, uh, appreciated the remarks that, that we heard tonight about actually letting the park drive whatever may happen in that location rather than the reverse, waiting for the roundhouse. As we know that, um, what is that, six years ago when we had the hotel proposal before us, um, there was a significant um, public outcry around that. And I think that we need to, especially around the impact on the park. So the fact that we're placing the park in the foreground here and really placing the emphasis in that development before looking at the roundhouse um, does seem appropriate to me. And I, I do intend to support this tonight. Um, I have a few questions, and I do believe this is an adequately detailed detailed order. I don't think that they're all equally as vague. But um, as, as far as one project driving the other, um, and, and someone in public comment brought this up, what's the likelihood that we can have a coordinated effort so that you know, it happens together rather than one project driving the other? That's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. Sure. Well, first of all, there are two different. Uh, first of all, the Pulaski Park is Chapter 97 parkland that's owned, controlled by the DPW. The other parcel is a city owned parcel. Um, and again, if you, the, the report's not quite out yet, but if you look at the, um, if you look at the initial work that was presented in the public forum around the Roundhouse lot, again, there's a real, yes, the two, um, the two are adjacent to each other, um, but there are, you know, there's, there's a still a lot of uncertainty about what, what the actual economic viability of a development in the roundhouse lot is. I think that's one of the things that came through so far in the work. And I don't think that moving forward with this project is going to really preclude um, the two projects being coordinated. In fact, one of the, one of the issues that came up was that, um, some of the work that's in the park itself um, could could uh, be part of a, f a future RFP on this lot could um, could ask a developer to help um, contribute to the public benefit the, uh, it, the, that we're trying to create in the park. That could be one potential thing. So um, I think it would be helpful. Let me. Um, well, I, because it's a it's a very brief letter, but I, I do think it's this again is from our pre-development consultant. Um, thank you for providing an opportunity for Utila Mass Development to present our analysis of potential development scenarios for the Roundhouse lot. Uh, we found the audience receptive to our methodology. Uh, this is all just sort of opening boiler uh, boilerplate. Um, the public process for the Roundhouse lot made it clear that there are only three possible outcomes supported by the public. Uh, two building residential development with a park facing community space over two level structured parking. Uh, no development, but potential improvements to the stair between the municipal lot and the park. And three, a, par a parking garage with the same characteristics as option one above, uh, but with an extension of open space above. Those are sort of the three broad scenarios that came out of that process. Um, uh, 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 since option three cannot be financed, only options one and three <coughs> are pathways forward. And in either case, the current proposal for the redesign of Pulaski Park is an ideal complement 
Um, also, having the final park design in place can positively affect the future of the roundhouse lot by providing a more robust and meaningful context uh, for future designs. Um, in addition, and writing as an experienced urban designer, I think that the design prepared by Scott Simpson and Associates is well considered, elegant, and appropriately planned for the projected uses of the space. Um, it would be a shame to lose the momentum of a long community-focused process that has resulted in what will surely be both an award-winning design and a significant new addition to Northampton's public realm. While the unknowns circling the roundhouse lot have been considerably narrowed as a result of our process, um, I would recommend that Scott Stimson Associates and team focus their design energies north of the east-west path the design team has proposed on the south end of the park, and that this path will define the northern limit. So it's getting a little into detail, but essentially you get the gist of it, that, that um, uh, waiting to figure out what's going to happen in the roundhouse lot, um, yeah, I'm, comf I'm confident that we should really be moving forward, particularly since there's now grant monies coming available for park renovations. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in East Hampton with the announcement of the Nashwanic uh, Pond uh, grant funds and Secretary Sullivan announced that they're going to be shifting from not just doing urban park programs for gateway cities, but they're now going to be expanding that to other cities. Um, and I, I made sure I meant, uttered the words Pulaski Park to him more than a few times uh, when that program gets rolled out. So I believe working on getting a shovel-ready design to be able to access those funds is important so and the committee had some of these same chicken and egg questions as they were re reviewing this application as well uh, how can we move forward with the park if we don't know what's happening with the roundhouse should we do the roundhouse first you know how how is this all playing out but in the end agreed that there are elements of Pulaski Park that, that the city needs to figure out now we need to figure out what the community wants and needs in a park and get those elements designed and um, Stephen Simpson and his team indicated that, that they will work with the roundhouse developers and create some options for that portion of the park to, to make it work together. Actually, if I, could, actually have, I have a couple more questions. Well, you have some follow-up. Um, uh, for the mayor, um, the design costs, um, and I, I, I support this order, uh, but to me it seemed like a, a large amount just dollar-wise when I looked at it, but um, what's the total project going to cost? Because um, in the past, for example, the police station, it, typically in, in other projects like the high school and um, at one point the DPW facility, but I think the price tag has, has risen. I remember uh, the former mayor telling us that designs were generally around 10% of the total project cost. I'm not sure if this is the same because those are for buildings and this isn't, but um, what's the cost of the, of the, of the, of the, the estimated cost of, of the final, of the total project? Again, uh, we don't until, be, a part of this is there was a conceptual design done to get to the stage we're at now. And then what the Stimson team is going to do is actually further refine that. And they're going to, and they're going to do a public process to really try to get additional input to refine the design. So part of, but you're right, there are, it's often referred to as soft costs or, or uh, you know, that, that those costs that are associated as a percentage of a building project. And so part of what this is funding is the, the continue, the, the, the finalization, the completion of that um, sort of visioning process to finalize the design. And then there's actually, and this was sort of the debate that, that Sarah mentioned, then the very next phase is to go right into creating construction drawings and, and actually, um, you know, leading the construction effort at that point. So that's the sort of the two different price components that you're seeing reflected in this dollar amount, which again, I, I realize it seems considerable, but as a percentage of a project that's projected to be on the order of 1.4 to $1.5 million, um, it, it is in line with what we've seen in other communities when we've looked at these gateway urban park projects. Final question. Uh, I think Ms. Lavallee would probably be able to answer this. Uh, uh, Councillor Barge asked a good question. This, this one, um, the, the vote was 6-2 at CPC, and, and um, all the others were unanimous this time around. And I didn't quite catch why they, they want the, the, the two that were in opposition were only in opposition because of they wanted the, the process somehow separated from the rest of the order? They didn't want to award the whole 194500 at this point. They wanted to separate it into two different segments of the project. But they absolutely were in favor of developing the designs and getting community input. Thank you. Councillor Freeman Daniel. Thank you. I, um, 
I have to disagree uh, that um, that we should proceed with the uh, Pulaski Park um, renovations before we have a clear picture of uh, the roundhouse parcel. And um, uh, I I think, I, however, I am supportive of of allocating funds to redesigning Pulaski Park. Um, I also have understood, and I, th I mean, this was, I think, partially reflective of the CPC's interests uh, uh, in their voting as well, um, that uh, there's, there's likely to be a public um, input process, uh, f a, a forum or two, and, um, uh, or, a, you know, a charrette or, or a, you know, a, um, a type of uh, work in progress, you know, um, presentation and so on, to uh, to gauge the community interests and needs, and um, and so I don't think I don't think we need to get um, all uh, excited about the prospect of grant funds coming up tomorrow, um, because there will be a, pro a lengthy process associated with this. Um, so I think if, if we can we can afford to wait because the plan is to wait but I'd actually like to see the timeline uh, that is presented um, I didn't see that I, I, I saw reference to the city's the, the city's interest the city's calendar the city's timetable but I don't know what timetable that is whose that is uh, is it the boards is it is it the Board of Public Works is it the CPC's is it the mayor's um, I'm very uncomfortable with that timetable because I do think that this, I do not believe this is a chicken and egg problem, um, and I don't believe that one should necessarily drive the other in either circumstance. I think that they should happen, uh, w that one should happen with the other in mind, and that the other should happen with the first in mind. Uh, and I, I just want to, I don't, I, I prefer, I really appreciated uh, Util and um, Mr. Love, he, uh, he was a, 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 a great presenter and um, a, a smart person um, but uh, of course he's going to believe that his his presentation uh, is going to fit well with this the Stimson uh, the, with the Stimson plan because that's where he started uh, in fact when and and I just to just to comment on what he said uh, not in the letter but in the um, in during at both meetings in which I was there he said that the Stimson design um, wasn't very clear when it came to the roundhouse area, uh, and that it, it could uh, it could be improved. It could it could um, it was that was the least sort of focused element of the of the design for the um, Pulaski Park, and that um, and if, and this his filled that in a little bit. The util um, work filled filled that in. But um, if we have a situation where the community desires to um, fund a two-level parking garage and green space. So in other words, no apartment. Um, we will have really missed an opportunity to develop one park that stretches where the Pulaski Park is now all the way over the roundhouse lot. We'll have missed that opportunity if we let the Stimson Associates go through with this. We'll have two parks. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not, but we will have uh, passed that up, and I think it's a mistake to do that. Mm -hmm. So first, in terms of input on the park, and we need extensive public input, <clears throat> I was just remembering my daughter, who was on the Youth Commission, I believe she was a junior in high school, was selected to be on extensive processes already discussing input from the community on Pulaski Park. This is one of those projects that's gone on and on, and input and input and more input. And there's a time where we, as, even in this place where we can talk endlessly, call a question. There was a great deal of input. I even remember Abby coming home one night and said, how do you put up with this? People just talking. To they had endless meeting, endless input. I think it was a good process. It was a long process. And it wasn't even the only process on obtaining public input into the design of the park. That's number one. The second question that I raise when the counselor speaks is, why do we spend money on experts and consultants? Here's a, one of the most recognized consultants in the field on this particular area. It's a very specific area. And if we're not going to, and it wasn't like somehow he was unequivocal about it. He said, well, this, it sounds like a good idea. Maybe we should. That letter basically said, this is an ideal compliment. This is something you should be doing. This is a strong recommendation. Someone who's been a consultant. I know when I'm, 
make that kind of recommendation, I am putting my professional credentials on the line. And so to insinuate that somehow, of course, he has some interest because, you know, he's saying his interest is there to support this thing. That interest was there because this is what he believed as a professional was, is in the best interest in the city. So I would say if, if, if we say, okay, we're going to second guess this at this point, and in addition, we have a very good committee that most of us recommend, uh, most of us know on the CPA, who discuss these kind of things, which is why we have them do it for hours and hours and hours. And what I'm hearing is this, the, in, in terms of intent on this, there was a unanimous vote. There was a difference of opinion about breaking up the spending. Um, I'm going to support this, and I hope everybody else can support this as well. Any other comments other than Council? Just, just a one line, <coughs> yes, 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 to Councilor Spencer's comments. Uh, Councilor Casey. Yeah. Um, is there going to well, is there going to be a cap on the amount of money that will be spent on the park? Uh, not as as this order is currently framed. No. This this you is just regarding the design. An order at one point for $800,000 to design an $8 to $10 million facility in Northampton. We spent the money, and the facility came in at 30, uh, just under $30 million. It didn't get built. We didn't even spend one-third of the money that it took to design it just to get us to the point <coughs> where it was going to cost us almost $30 million. So, and now we're paying that money back. I know it was a bond and this is CPA money, but I would like to know if they're going to put a cap on how much was spent because 10% is all public works projects for design and engineering, 10% of the total cost of the, of the project. So that brings us up near $2 million. And how much grant money, how much will the city, where's the money actually going to come from? And if we could put a cap on it, I might be more willing to say yes. I, I was just going to say that um, you're right about the 10%, the but you're, you're, what you're not factoring in is that there's a separate piece of the funding that you're being asked to approve tonight, which is for the public design process. That was the piece that, and that's where some members of the CPC wanted to separate the, that 10% design piece from the uh, preliminary schematic uh, public process. So I don't know, is that broken down, uh, what the numbers, what that difference is? Like, I don't know what it is. But I mean, I, this is a high priority for my administration, which is why when the CPC rejected it the first time, I put my name on the application as a sponsor of it and went before the committee both times to advocate for it. Um, and I will assure you that I will do everything I can to find the funding uh, through state sor sources, through grant money, through whatever it is to get this park done. I can't tell you how many people have complained to me about like, why are we, you know, why are we building new parks and new fields and you've got a park in the center of downtown that looks the way that park looks. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that and I've had to try to explain to them, well, the way the law is structured, we can't actually do that. Well, now we can do it. And I feel like this, this, is, this is not only an important public space, you know, this is a you know, one of our free speech zones in the city. This is a place, a democratic park in many ways. It's where people come to celebrate Casimir Pulaski, to hula hoop, to protest. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a significant downtown space, and I think this is an important investment. Um, one of the things we talked about was just that whole area of downtown and trying to really enliven it and make Pulaski Park more of a place that people want to go and go with their children and go with families. Um, so, you know, I think this is, a, this is a major priority for me or my name wouldn't be on the application. Um, so rest assured, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that this is funded, that we're not going to just design this and the design is going to sit on the shelf. Um, so that's, that's the best assurance I can give you. And the Community Preservation Committee absolutely recognizes that any time that they recommend funding for a, for a design or a study, that there's a chance that those, that those funds may be lost, that the study will show something that we don't want to see or that, des that the designs will sit on the shelf. Um, but in this case, for all the reasons that Mary Narquist just said, they recognize the importance of funding Pulaski Park at, at this point in getting the ball rolling. Councilor mm -hmm. Freeman-Dana. Um, just to respond to Councilor Spector, um, 
because uh, I was I was making t a couple of points. Um, first of all, Util uh, was asked to come in and show commercially viable development projects, and so their development project had the park ending at a building, um, like I like the other, which led to my other point, uh, which obviously they used the Simpson proposal, which I'm I'm a big fan of it, but um, they that proposal ends at the edge of the at the at what the cliff that exists now uh, and that's where util put the building so we hired them to give us a specific answer and they did um, however we've heard from the public uh, and I don't necessarily support this but if it is the case that we decide that the city decides that we want to have a two-level parking garage with green space which is not which is doesn't have the same commercial viability uh, the city would have to make an investment in that We'll have, we'll have, uh, I'll say it again, we'll have missed an opportunity, missed a chance to really have one large green space, one large park, and instead we'll have a Stimson Park, which could be award-winning, and we'll have some other park behind it. And I think it's a mistake to uh, do one before the other. Further comment? I, I'm, I'm just a little confused. I mean, why would that be? I mean, if if the if you're expanding the green park to a larger park over out over a parking garage, why would we have two parks? Why wouldn't we have just one that one could the initial plan could expand out over that if that if that's the case? Well, um, th I mean, this is a design question, right? So I, I'm, I'm I can answer it based on my limited ability to answer design questions, but it, it's the case that the Stimson plan has a certain orientation it has a certain uh, projected use for the different elements in the park you'd have um, you, you really could you I guess you could carbon copy it and put it behind it but you would really have two separate elements um, wouldn't, that you wouldn't, wouldn't be would able it be to possible with the second park that they could that they would be charged with considering uh, conforming and and rhyming with the park as it stands and using the uh, the park that that may possibly evolve from this as the starting point or driving as it were the second park on the features there do you, do you mind if I answer uh, directly? Yeah, yeah, you answer directly. directly so so what you're asking me is what, what you're asking is could we build a building and then if we want to add on to it later add on to it in a similar way sure but you could also plan to build a bigger building which has different features and elements in it um, if you know that you're going to do if you know that you're going to have a larger footprint then you might want to design for that larger footprint um, it's not always the best to build a little house and then make an addition to it if you know that you're going to build a bigger house later you might as well just build a bigger house right so this is the that's the analogy you could have a rhyming thing but you might miss an opportunity for a really amazing singular park that is that has a, a one long feature or or a you know, you know a zigzag going through it I, that's not the point is when util comes and recommends something they're on they're in the business of building a building at the end of Pulaski park and so that's why the park that's why the stimson uh, design fits so well because you could put a building at the end of it there may not be a building at the end of it there may be green space at the end of it i think it's a mistake to do to have one process and from the other. I don't see why we can't do them both. I think it's, I, I have to disagree that it's, that it makes any sense from a design perspective. Councillor mm -hmm. Casey. The development potential in the, let's call it the hotel lot or the roundhouse lot, whatever you want, uh, is marginal at best. And we, we seem to have come to that conclusion. And so I, I wouldn't be at all on board with making something that would require the developer of the park to actually do more uh, I mean I'm not looking to give away the store here um, but I would like to at least give the developer a chance to figure out just exactly what he's going to spend I mean I don't even know if it's economically feasible for a development of that particular piece of property um, so what, I, I, I'm not going to support it um, I think there's one thing that people universally agree on and that that's Pulaski Park is awful. I mean, everybody hates Pulaski, everybody. And 
I too have mentioned to a lot of people the restraint that used to be on us under the CPC requirements that we couldn't do it. And they'd say, it's park is awful, why haven't you done it? And I, we had to say, because we couldn't spend the money on it. Now not only can we spend the money on it, but there's a potential for a state funding cycle for a park like that. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do it, and the fact that we enhance that park is probably going to increase the development potential of what's down the hill. And I, and I for one, think that we might end up with lots of things there, but it isn't going to be a parking garage with a green space on top of it. I mean, you know, I think we'll end up with a nuclear reactor down there before we're going to end up with a parking garage with green space on top of it. So I, I'm happy to support this one. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Um, I'll disagree in that I don't hate Pulaski Park. I actually, I actually enjoy <laughs> Pulaski Park. And it, but I absolutely agree that it can be improved and enhanced. And in fact, actually, this goes back to the other question about public space and how we use public space and the fact that we don't, that, that many of our problems arise from the absence of public space. My, my concern, and I wasn't trying to be argumentative, I was clearly asking because I was trying to figure out what, what it was you were driving at. Um, my concern is the stasis that, that Councilor Spector refers to. We can be stymied by process. Uh, this is a concern of mine during one political campaign that I think we're all familiar with, that, that at some point public process and process and process only supports process. It, kills, it can kill actual things. And in this case, I think if we don't take a step forward, um, we're all a little gun shy, and I think we earned it. But at the same time, I'm not, I don't think it's appropriate to be, to be handcuffed to, 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 to stop on the basis of probabilities. I think that there has to be some aspect of courage and vision here. And, I, and, and actually, I do take Councilor Freeman Daniel's point. He's saying let's not restrict the vision. Let's, let's keep the options open for the vision. I don't think, but I do disagree in saying that I don't think that that's actually going to be the issue here. I think the issue here, the issue here is that we're going to be stuck. We're going to be stuck for political reasons. We're going to be stuck because invariably there's going to be someone who's going to disagree with someone else's vision as it's being applied. This goes back to the public art discussion. We got to go forward. We have to. We have to move. And this, there are opportunities here, and they're promising opportunities. And I actually think that we, I am actually desperate to feel excited about something. Um, and and I and I'm looking forward to being excited about this. And maybe I accept the fact that that comes with the implied risk of my excitement translating into something that might be something we can't even imagine. But everything comes with its own pr sets of risk. There's an element of risk to this, yes. But the prospects are a lot more alluring and, have, and hold great, much more promise for the community. Because as the mayor pointed out, this is our center. This is our core. This is, we're adjacent to this. Everything that the, this community spends most of its time identifying itself by the things that stick out of the ground, not the ground, not the park. I would love that the park actually not only drive the development that goes behind it, but every future consideration for development within the community. And if we start with that, if we start with something, the park that I like, if we found a park that everyone liked, <laughs> or that everyone agreed was, was certainly a place that they would like to share and enjoy, then that, I think we've done the right thing. I've done, I think we've invested the way we're supposed to invest. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about the prospect of calling this question <laughs> finance. Does anybody else feel that way? <laughs> all right. I'll turn that. All, 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 all in favor. Aye. Aye. Of a positive recommendation? Any opposed? Great. Dave continues. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that, whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission submitted a CPA application for the purchase of 58-acre parcel to add to the Sawmill Hills Conservation Area, and whereas this is an environmentally important location that will provide opportunities for trail and habitat connections, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan, 
uh, and open space recreation and multi-use trail plan to protect open space and provide for passive recreation. And whereas on November 20th, 2013, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $170,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project and whereas the City Council voted to authorize the purchase of this property and that authority remains in effect now therefore it be ordered that 170,000 be appropriated from the Community Preserva Act, Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission for Sawmill Hills open space acquisition and that the grantee meet the, meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council specifically that 161,000 $126 is appropriated from the CPA open space reserve account and $8,874 is appropriated from the CPA budget reserve. Okay. Motion. Recommend. <coughs> Motion to approve. Second. Uh, <coughs> discussion on this one. I'm going to know until I see a, a manage, management plan for the city. Okay. Council Point. Oh, conservation. Council pointed this out as well. The last whereas, whereas the City Council voted to authorize the purchase of this property already, and the authority remains in effect. Could somebody just explain that to me? So Wayne came before the City Council, I believe, in September uh, for the authority to purchase this property. And there, there was no funding tied to it at that point. It's just to, to move forward with the acquisition. That we just go to that point. We're just adding, just add money now. Wasn't this the property owned by Samilski? Yes. That yeah. we're getting stuff. Any other? On this one? Great. All in favor of positive aye. recommendation? Aye. Aye. No. Aye, aye. No. Okay. Um, and that uh, being the end uh, of motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 In favor? Aye. 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 Thank Did, you. Would you like me to stay for discussions in council? I, no. I think we're okay. Yeah. There's also there's um, yeah. there's been a request for a recess. Okay. Yes, please. You want you want Sarah to stay? Number six. We'll keep. We'll 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 move that first. Okay. But after a five minute recess, how's that? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna recess for five minutes, which is more like seven. We'll be back. Welcome back. We're coming out of recess. Uh, this is the City Council meeting of December 5th, 2013. Uh, we're coming out of recess and going back into the regular meeting. We've recessed out of finance. Um, and we're going to start. We're going to move um, item 6 out of order just uh, upon request. And this is, uh, I don't know if councilors want me to read this. It's the financial appropriation of $194,000 from the Community Preservation Act funding uh, the Pulaski Park Renovation Project. I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, Sarah LaValle was recognized in finance. You want to extend that recognition here? Yep. Will someone actually move that? Move recognition of Sarah. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, Sarah, you're... Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Ms. Lavalley, I uh, you know I'm sorry. Can I have a motion to put this on the floor? We did. We did. Where was I? Was I here? Right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Council Freeman Daniels. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I think it's the will of the council to pass this, um, but I, I feel I would really like to have greater clarity about the um, the timeline that has been uh, discussed by this uh, for the city. Um, what the city's timeline is, um, and whether that was part of the CPC, and who, and actually, who is the, who is the body that's going to be dictating this timeline? So the the way that memorandums of understanding between um, city agencies and the, the community preservation committee are set up, it's a timeline of three years, that's only had to been be extended in one case with really good cause. So it would take place within there, but that would be deferred, the, the decision about when things would actually be taking place would be deferred to the applicant, so the mayor and the Board of Public Works. So the mayor and the Board of Public Works are going to set the timeline for this, f for um, the public process, which is, we're funding it to the tune of something like $44,000, is that right? Yes. Okay. So, so contrary to what was mentioned in committee, 
there will be a public process regarding this. Yes, not, absolutely. We're not pulling a trigger tomorrow regarding this. No, one, one of the concerns when this was initially proposed last round that the, the committee had was that they saw the Stimson design and it seemed like a done deal. Like this, this is the design. Is, are we be sure at this point that's really what we want? So the, the committee asked the Board of Public Works to come back with a revised proposal, and Stimson made it very, very clear that that was just a result of the design competition. It wasn't all that detail that was done under a time crunch, and that going forward there will be a lot of public input and, and so, a revised design. So what I'd like to see before we vote on this is that is that timeline, or a rough timeline that the applicant would can present to us, and that shouldn't be too hard because that's the Board of Public Works and the mayor. Uh, do you do you know if it's ready to move forward at this point? I mean, typically the Community Preservation Committee defers to applicants as long as the work is done within the three-year time frame. Right. But I, I think the council sh should at least see the timeline. I mean, everyone's talking about the urgency of this, so I'd like to see what the timeline is. Uh, Stimson's ready to be engaged no, um, I mean, in their process. What, I mean, is this January, February? Is this six months? That's kind of, I'd like to see that. Um, I think, well, part of this is we, it's difficult for us to engage Stimson and thus we know we have the funding. And so what, if in fact we get the funding, then we'll sit down with Stimson and come up with a plan for how to do this. Oh, um, nice. So that's, I mean, but my timeline and uh, is that I want us to see that get this process started so that we can have, <laughs> have it go through the early part of 2014 and be ready to go um, when the next state fiscal budget is available and there's funding opportunities to be able to work work with so that you want the plan completed by July, I'd like to see July 1st uh, I don't think that that's unreasonable to have a public process and and uh, on this particularly given all the uh, the the um, earlier public processes that have taken place around this design so I, th I think it's reasonable to expect that this could happen in six to nine months yeah I, I totally do I mean, is that, but that's your timeline. Uh, You're yeah, the applicant, so. I haven't had a chance to sit down with uh, <coughs> the DPW, BPW to talk about it. But again, they, they've been, you know, if you go to their meeting room, they've had these designs hanging on their walls for the last, you know, five or six years. The only thing they haven't had is a funding source to be able to actually advance them. So they're ready to move forward. And, um, and I'm certainly ready to move forward on it. Uh, so. If you're asking me to give you a printed timeline, I, I can't give that to you tonight. Printed is okay, but uh, you don't need to print it. But you're saying July 1 is No, I, I'm, what, you what I'm have. saying, that, that's my, my own personal hope. But again, it's hard for me to say that without meeting with, sitting uh, down and not, talking to Stimson. I'm not asking for a warranty. I just okay. want to know what you'll be pushing for. That's, that's what I'll be pushing okay, for. Thanks. Yeah, that's and, what I'll be pushing for. Um, out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, What's, do you also have a timeline for wrapping up the Roundhouse uh, uh, um, mass development project? Well, we have a, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to have that. Uh, so Mr. Love, Util was engaged pretty much to do just a very finite amount of work that mass development paid for. That report we're hoping to be, is going to be issued in the next couple of weeks. We think that he's got it finalized and, uh, and, and we're hoping that's going to be issued soon. It's going to require bringing back together the committee, which is going to be in a little bit of limbo because we're going to have a new ed. <coughs> so that's going to delay that a little bit. Um, but my hope is to, to get that out to the committee and to the public so that they have a chance to review it. Um, but I think that, that, that report is going to provide some information, but in some cases it's going to provide other questions that, that need to be thought about. So I am not in a hurry on the, on the roundhouse lot project I'm not I there's there's a lot of moving parts not the least of which is still the environmental stuff that's still um, there that would have to be dealt with that has to be dealt with um, but uh, you know I'm hoping we'll have a deliberate process on, on that one and there's a whole other process that I know the committee expressed wanting to do additional public forums um, based on uh, the, the turnout that they had at the first one but wanting to do more so I'm you know, I'm going to work with the committee to figure out what they want to do going forward. Um, but I don't see, you know, that's, that's not on a similar track for me. Um, and believe me, no one wants to see us be successful with that project if there's a successful project to be had more than I do. I, w I, w I want that to happen. 
So if I felt that the Pulaski Park thing was going to somehow jeopardize that or somehow compromise it or somehow, I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be advocating for this project to move forward. Um, I just don't want to see us not do anything in either project and, and then we're sort of where we are. Um, that's my concern. Um, so. so thank you. Speaking as the applicant. Um, uh, no questions. Uh, just a uh, statement. Um, the mayor is, uh, is showing real leadership on this, and um, and uh, I support this uh, this uh, order. Any other discussion? No other discussion. Um, roll call, please. Adams. Yes. 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 No. All right. Now we're back to the numerical order. This is the financial order. This is appropriation of seventy-four thousand five hundred seventy-three dollars and thirty-eight cents. Uh, and there's a request for two readings. This is uh, from Smith Vocational Stabilization Fund for purchase of computers, iPads, and other technology. Uh, to meet curriculum software. So moved. Second. Second it. Further discussion? No further discussion. Uh, roll call on first reading, please. Yes. 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 Move to suspend. To suspend rule 14. Uh, motion's been made by Council Adams, seconded by Council LaBarge. All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion on second reading. Second reading is moved. Is there a second? Second. second? second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Council Dwight? Yes. Council Freeman Daniels? Aye. Council LaBarge? Yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Schwartz? Yes. Council Speckley? Yes. Council Texas? Yes. Council Adams? Yes. Yes. Item number two, and this is also a request for two readings. Uh, this is a financial order of appropriation of $22,000 from the Stabilization Fund, uh, Ray, economic impact analysis of the proposed MGM Springfield Casino. Excuse me, Counselor. Um, did you say two readings or one? Two I readings were one requested on, on this. Two readings. Yeah, this is an oversight. They, he does one. Hmm. Move approval. Second. Motions are made and seconded. Council Freeman Daniels. I believe the reason for two readings tonight is so that the firm can be employed uh, quickly, so that we can um, submit early in 2014. The city can submit its uh, um, appeal. I think was it an appeal or its <laughs> or its initial uh, uh, claim against uh, for mitigation against MGM. Um, I believe uh, we need to spend this. <laughs> to spend it now. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on, on this appropriation? Roll call, please. Council yes. 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 Suspend rule 14. Second. Second. Motions been made to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Move to approve. Second. The motions are made to second reading. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, this is an appropriation of thirty thousand dollars from the CPA funding to the Conservation Commission for North Northampton Ecological Assessment of Open Space. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Passes in first reading. 
Uh, next up is the appropriation of $250,000 from the CPA funding to uh, Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability for the Neurotic Mass Central Rail Trail Extension Project. I'll accept a motion. So moved to approve. Second it. Motion's been made by Councilor Adams and seconded by Councilor Tacey. Uh, any further discussion on this? Councilor Tacey. Yeah. Um, I know full well that this is going to pass. Um, I'm going to abstain from this for reasons, personal reasons. Okay. I don't want to get in a. I know all the people that are going to be supplying material to this and stuff like that, and I. Uh, so for you're you're abstaining because of a possible conflict. Yes. Got it. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. I get to vote twice. <laughs> 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 well, are you really sure about it? You committed to that? <laughs> that passes first reading. Uh, next up is an appropriation of $250,000 from the Community Preservation Act funding to 23. 34 New South Street Apartments Restoration Project. I'll accept a motion. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Council yeah. Casey? Uh, I, I was just, I've been thinking about it since uh, we voted on it in finance, but I know that we did purchase an affordability extension on the New South Street building for some period of time. I think it was 35 years, I'm not sure. I don't know how much money we paid for it um, and where exactly the money came from. I've got it at the top of my head. but. At this point, I'm going to have to vote no on this because I don't think that us purchasing an affordable extension is, it seems like we're going to keep maybe dumping money into this private entity every so many years for years and years to come. So I'm going to have to vote no. Any further discussion? Councilor Freeman Daniels? Uh, yeah, I, um, I do agree that the uh, like I said before, we need better specificity, but um, the uh, this project is both we have a both historical building and um, affordable housing, so it, it fits criteria that um, the CPA is created for, and um, it also serves as uh, the, our president said it serves um, uh, for uh, affordable housing in the downtown area, which is is very important. So uh, I, I I will support this. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor No. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? No. <coughs> Councilor Short? Yes. Uh, now we're up to number seven, which is the appropriation of $170,000 from Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission for Sawmills Open Space Acquisition Project. Move to approve. Second. 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 We did it earlier. We did six. Oh, yeah, we did that. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. Hey, I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I made that motion, uh, too. Council Carney made the motion. I believe Council Labard seconded. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion? Yeah, I'm gonna, I will vote uh, no on this one until we see something done uh, from our previously approved item number three on a plan of management. Any Thank further, you. Any further discussion? Yeah, Councilor Freeman Daniels. If we're going to place a conservation restriction on this as usual, I'd like to know who's going to be holding it. But we can. So it's a request? No. No. Request? It's, it, no it's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, between now and next. You mean, it's, it's, okay. I, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sarah might have known. Sarah might have known, and we oh. dismissed her. Right. Okay, Sarah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Casey? No. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Boyd? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Um, this is on second reading. This is of the results of the biennial municipal election held in the city of on Tuesday, November 5th. 
2013 and the said persons be declared elected to such offices. Uh, uh, second. Second. Reading. Wave reading. Wave reading. Thank you. The wave reading. Uh, wave, <laughs> it was a long reading last time. The motion's been made by Councilor Tacey. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. Any discussion on this? Got some real misgivings. No, you have some, <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Freeman Daniels has some misgivings. <laughs> Noted. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 You don't need a roll call. Is that a roll call? Roll call. Yeah, let's do it. Let's. Yes. 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 All right. Aye. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Short. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Yes. Okay. That. Uh, okay. It's been a request to do nine and ten together, and, and they do. Second. Go, they go together, and in there's in one second. And all those in favor of nine Aye. and two. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. This is a uh, warrant to restrain dogs between January 1st and 2014, December 31st, 2014, uh, and then also a warrant to catch and confine dogs January 1st, 2014, to December 31st. Move to approve Second. Uh, any discussion about dog restraint? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I'm hoping no one wants a roll call on that. That's yep. it. Uh, <coughs> this uh, will motion call. move what? 11 and 12 as a group. 11 and 12. Motions are made to second. Uh, all those in favor of moving them as a group, please say aye. 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 Um, Both? No, actually, I had a question. Yes. On the committee, committee on hearings, investigations, and practice. Yeah. I'd like to separate oh, okay. them. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So uh, then, like uh, to take them separately. I, I re retract that. Got it. All right. So the motion, we will deal with these one at a time then. Um, this this is um, this originally tabled. This is adopt a council committees. Uh, this, this is from August 15th, 2013. It was tabled on December 5th, which you might note is today, 2013. First reading. <laughs> Accept a motion. So, so moved. Second it. Motions are made and second it. Um, wave reading. Yeah, wave reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. Forever. Come on. <laughs> uh, Councilor Adams. Um, I'll make this brief due to the late hour. Um, so we 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 had this back on June twentieth, and um, I'm I'm glad that we voted or that we voted to to table it to this point because. Um, that way, every councilor has had almost six months, actually six months, to to look this over and hopefully give it some consideration. I've spoken to most councilors, uh, maybe even all councilors, about some of the changes. Um, and uh, I also drafted an executive summary back in, back in June, which I hope people took the time to read, because I wanted to explain the reasoning behind some of the changes and, again, give councilors adequate time to consider them. Um, it's upon the strong recommendation of the city solicitor that we remove these from ordinance and move them into, as an order, into the rules. Um, but, but also, the council has expressed um, that it wished to also take this as an opportunity to consider the committees, the various functions, and if there's any way we can um, create efficiencies by joining some of the committees that maybe don't do as much work typically as some of the other committees do. Um, and I haven't seen as of yet um, any amendments, but I'll, I'd be happy to consider it. Um, just a few brief points from the, from the executive summary. Um, again, these were rewritten to comply with the separation of powers as delineated in the new charter. And the, the, the powers and duties section is taken almost word for word from the city's charter. Um, most of the committees have been reformatted, but the number of councilors on each committee have changed, and the areas of work have mostly changed, uh, stayed the same. Um, <clears throat> I'll discuss a couple of the changes. Particularly, I made a recommendation to merge ordinance rules and orders with appointments and valuations, and this is for a couple of different reasons. For one, appointments doesn't do evaluations any longer, that, and we can't due to the uh, separation of powers as delineated by the new charter. 
And um, so that, that committee is left with one function, one very important function. Um, but being that that committee now only has one function, I thought it might make sense to merge that with the ordinance committee because the ordinance committee chose this year to do away with one of its functions and that's the function of claim. So that, that committee now has some room to take that over. Um, and I also think that multiple member bodies are in charge of enforcing ordinances and so it makes sense that that um, that this same committee uh, be charged with doing ordinances as well as appointments um, because these this committee could have some influence on how multiple member bodies interpret ordinance um, cultural and recreation culture and recreation and social services and veterans affairs I've recommended this merger um, because as I wrote I believe both of these committees have important business to conduct but for the most part they perform review they and uh, they perform reviews and hearings with community groups. Um, they, they typically don't have an, a high number of uh, ordinances or orders that get referred to the committee, to these committees, so I thought it would make um, more sense and it would be more efficient if they were merged. Um, <clears throat> also, um, I made a recommendation that economic development, housing and land use, that uh, community development block grant um, funds proposals be reviewed in this committee and the reason why is because um, there are some there are generally two groups of CDBG um, types one has to do with social services and one has to do with more housing economic development land use and infrastructure uh, needs so I think those would make more sense to be reviewed by the economic development committee and the ones that pertain to social services would make more sense if reviewed by the social services committee which will now be merged that gives the mayor's administration more flexibility on who to present to based on um, what CDG, CDBG proposals will be more relevant um, which one will be more relevant in in which committee <clears throat> and so those are some of the so those are my basic recommendations and again, this was um, an attempt to, to, to take up what the solicitor suggested we do as far as um, moving these into the rules and to create efficiencies and review the council uh, committees wholesale. So um, that's it. I'm happy to discuss further. Thank you. Uh, council LaBarge, Council Freeman Daniels, Council Specter. Yes. Um, I talked with um, Councilor Adams in regards to uh, my concerns on how he has it written committee on cultural recreation veterans and social services um, and I also questioned him of exactly how busy were you with um, your committee on cultural and recreation and you did state to me what was it last week in regards to well you were very seldom busy with that committee. I have great concerns of it coming into social services and veterans affairs because we are booked for the whole year, except for one month in August. And I don't know if I'm gonna be back on that committee or not, but I do know with veterans affairs, we have Steve Connors who comes in and also we're like, we work together with the veterans council in Northampton so I wouldn't want any interference with that either I was just wondering if there was a possibility that this could go into um, the youth commission because if you're telling me that you're really not that busy in that committee why not put it with the youth commission which you have students throughout our school systems that are intercultural into art and so forth like that I don't I don't think that um, merging cultural recreation and and um, and the youth commission uh, would make sense the youth commission may, maybe the chair of that could explain a little more That's but why I'm but also I, I mean I mean these are my recommendations if you want to move that feel free I mean I, I, I submitted this back in June and I, I haven't heard um, until our discussion a couple of days ago in city clerk's office. I haven't, I haven't heard um, of any, of, of any 
proposed changes, and I haven't seen any written motions to that effect or, or oral. And, and so this, this process has been going on for a long time. These are my recommendations. And again, I've, I've given my explanations and reasoning for it um, back in June. And I think, and I actually do think that culture, recreation, and social services and veterans affairs makes sense to merge because we do need to keep in mind that under our new charter, um, we can't compel nonprofits to, to appear before us. And so um, uh, social services may, may find itself not as busy as it, as it once was. And also, you can, you, can, um, uh, you, can, you can slot a time right in there, for example, to hear from the Arts Council for a half hour um, or even less uh, or, whatever, or whatever other groups are under the purview of culture and recreation, recreational services. And um, and if and if you feel you're feeling overloaded, then you don't even have to hear from them uh, on on a, on a regular basis. You can hear from them once a term, rather than once you know quarterly or once a year. So um, I do think that this this merger makes sense. Thank you. Um, and just a point of information: the youth the youth commission. Uh, I'm not the chair. Actually, there I'm not even a voting member. I'm a council liaison, similar to the old structure that disabilities was. Okay. Um, I, I do know yeah. Councillor Tacey did bring it up at Social Services and Veterans Affairs. Am I correct, Councillor Tacey, that you had concerns about the cultural and recreation being placed in this committee? I had concerns about not having enough time for veterans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Councilman. It seems like uh, I'm not. I'm not convinced that, that, that this is the worst um, scenario. There, we have our committee is booked for a year right now. Yeah. Booked for a year in advance. How many times do we see? Um, do we have the Veterans Council before us, and how many times do we have the same ones that come in constantly all the time, time after time? And uh, so I'm kind of I'm curious as to whether or not there, if these committees really have very little to do. The cultural committee. That's what and Jesse said. Very little. Uh, and we have to be careful here because uh, we're actually now asking each other questions and we're not conducting. So if 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 you could uh, pause yeah. the question, you, you see what I'm saying? Because actually, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels was next to speak. So um, oh, you were sorry. you were originally. I mean, no, it was fine. You were answering a question that was directed to you, yeah. so that was fair. Um, and we'll get back to you on that, uh, Councilor Barger. You done with your questions right now, or no? Oh. I I did talk with Councilor Adams in regards to that. I would like to see the name of the committee go: Social Services, Veterans Affairs, and Cultural and Recreation. I'll I'll, I'll move that. Okay. Um, that's that's a proposed amendment. Second. That's uh, all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I'm not opposed. Okay. Aye. All right, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I um, briefly served on uh, cultural, social services, and veterans affairs, and I was the chair of culture and rec. Um, I, I think that uh, the social services and veterans affairs is a busy committee, um, but I also, but um, and culture and recreation is not. Uh, we did a lot of soul searching actually in this past term um, regarding uh, you know whether we should. Um, continue on as a committee uh, at, because most of the time we were uh, we're doing work that um, was um, that you know obvious usually not it was just informational work uh, and uh, while valuable it, we really didn't provide a really great forum um, but we decided to keep the committee and rewrite it and uh, it was passed earlier this uh, term and uh, but but really our our docket wasn't very full, and uh, I, I think that merging uh, this one with um, social services and veterans affairs um, would uh, would be um, a good idea because it it would um, it would take a busy committee and a not very busy one and combine them into uh, to one that would quite frequently have a, have um, social service work to do, but but. Um, often not have a lot of art related work to do so I think that would be a good idea. Councilor Spector was next and then Councilor. I'm going to yield the floor for a second after 
What did we just vote on? <laughs> we just voted to just the name. All we do is change the, the name. I want to yield the floor, but I want it to. to Councilor Carney, then Councilor Smith. I'd like to come back. Uh, um, thank you. We were just handed this piece of um, the charter. And so maybe as a point of order, because my close read of this section that we just indicates that most of this conversation may be moot until we have brought in, as, as is um, required by the legislation here, the persons who were elected in the 2013 city election who should be involved in the discussion of the rules under which they will operate starting January 1st. Mm -hmm. As I read this closely, it, I, I appreciate all the work that um, Councillor Adams has done and all the work that we did looking <coughs> through this in the Ordinance Committee, but my suggestion as I read this section closely is that we may take this up in the next session yes. with the new councillors who will be operating under these rules did you and I'll ask um, uh, Council, Councilor Adams um, I, I yeah, and I forwarded this question to him uh, earlier today and it is it's and as he pointed out is worthy of deliberation and, and do you want to address that that's um, well I, I read this as pertaining to council rules and not committee structures um, I, don't, I don't I don't read this section as pertaining to structures of committees but only for council rules but the other thing is we do need something to be in place for the new council because if if if, if this does, isn't passed, then we have no committees. I mean, we're, our, our, the next thing we're voting on is to is to is to um, eliminate all the committees by ordinance entirely. So if that passes, as was the recommendation of the city solicitor, and we don't do this, we have no committees, and 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 the, and, and 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 the next council president can't appoint any councilor to any committee because we will have none. So. So I do think we should vote on this. And again, I don't. Th my just my reading is that this applies to rules because I don't see anything in here about council committees. If, if I may, sure, yeah. And uh, I just am curious because what we're doing is we're taking and putting into rules no. the. No, these are order. This is a council order. Okay, so this is so the establishment of committees is is in no way. Um, I thought we were writing that we were taking the committees out of ordinances and putting them into rules, putting them into the I, council I, rules. If can I respond? Please. When I read this, I, I read them as, I mean, even if these are placed in the rules, I read the rules that govern the conduct and business of the city council. I, I read that to mean our council so rules, as, rules, as rules, of, rules of procedure of governance um, rather than um, other whether rules or orders pertaining to, to committee structures. That, that's just my reading of it. Yeah. Um, Council Spector was next, but Councilor Freeman, do you want to speak? Yeah, to can I just speak to two, uh, two issues? Yeah. Number one, um, I remember this in an ordinance back in May or whatever, <laughs> whenever it was, um, that we were we had some debate about whether these were council rules, and um, we we clarified the language to make it make them council orders, but they would be placed in the same booklet basically that the rules are in, but they would be orders. Um, so that actually I think it says that in the order. Um, and the second one is this, it doesn't not seem, I agree with Councillor Adams reading, but this seems very cumbersome. And I suggest we use um, section 11 of this same section of the charter just to extend the, this, to extend these tra transitional provisions until the first, until January when um, what will happen is the council will vote on the rules. Uh, Councilor Specter was next, and then Councilor Murphy. I, I will yield until we've settled this because we're all about discussion. Yield. Got it. If we feel like we've settled this particular discussion, I copy. Councilor Murphy. And, and in fact, the, the first thing, whatever we do now to set the house in order, the first thing the new council does is adopt its rules for the next session. Mm -hmm. So whatever, if we set things in in place the way we think they should be now, the new council could amend them as soon as they start so we're saying hey we, you know in hindsight after this session and with the new charter here's the way we think it should be but the new council in their first meeting could decide in its infinite wisdom to just change them <laughs> so whatever we do now is subject to change by the new council when it gets here Councilor. Also, also by my reading of this I the organizational we, meeting we have mm -hmm. satisfies this as long as it's called by the most senior 
member of council, senior in age, senior in age, member of the council. Um, but I, I think that I think I think just that vote at the organizational meeting adopting the council oh. rules satisfies this. Um, so if we can conclude this part of the discussion, but if we're going to go back to that, I'll speak on. Um, My only, my only concern is that we conform to the conditions laid out by the charter because we don't trump the charter. Charter trumps us. So we, I want to be can clear. Use, we can just use section 11 of this. Of this I see, yeah, actually, your point on section 11 is, and I'll read that mm -hmm. without all the subsections. The, uh, the mayor and the city council in office at, to, at the time, at time the charter is adopted and the mayor and successor in the city council elected under the charter may adopt measures that clarify, confirm, or extend any of the transitional provisions mm -hmm. in order that the transition may be made in the most ex expeditious manner possible, provided that such authority shall not extend beyond five years. And yes. my, my point, Mr. Expedition. President, is, is that we do want to set up council, I'm sorry, the future council will want to set up its committees as quickly as possible and not deliberate, uh, uh, they can deliberate, but not be forced to deliberate right. over the councils. Councils. And, and you're I'm not ready now. I'm ready to leave ready. this topic and move on. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember where the chits are here. Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Specter, you can weigh in on this one. Yeah. How's that? And uh, you know when when both the ordinance committee and the committee that was formed to bring everything in conformance with the new charter, the solicitor was heavy, heavily involved in all of that, and in fact provided lots of guidance and made sure that everything we did conformed with the new charter. So I can't imagine this process that was set up and supervised by the solicitor would be going forward if the solicitor felt that it violated the charter, since the solicitor was involved both with ordinance and with, with the committee that revised ordinances to bring them in conformance with the charter or, not, or just get rid of them as ordinances and make them orders or rules or whatever. So. It, I'm comfortable we're okay just because of the involvement of the solicitor through that whole process. Councilor Specter, your dog aired in. I'm very comfortable now, so I'm going to speak to the actual question, right. and then if other people want to yeah. jump in on the process again, fine. I want to thank Councilor Adams for doing, <clears throat> for doing the work on this. I support all the changes that you've talked about. I mean, it was one was one committee rolling the appointments committee into ordinance committee. It was hard to see. I've been on that committee ever since I've been on the council. I've been chair of it for years. It's a, committee I really enjoy I think we do great work but I think it makes sense to roll it in to some other committee and I agree I don't think there's any other place to do that besides uh, ordinance committee which as you point out their workload is going down some I think the fact that we may make some of the committees a little juicier and give them a little more work is the counterbalance that as they're going to be fewer committees to fill that and I think we've in the past, we've often stretched ourselves pretty thin and start looking at each councilor having four committees or more, and that now we're consolidating them. So though the, those the committees that are left might have a little more work, I think it will be more efficient. I think it makes sense. So I support those changes. Uh, thank you for the dialogues that we've had in between, and I appreciate the work you've done. Uh, councilor Adams. Also, um, it sounds like from listening to Councilor Tacey, there's a lot of duplication of, uh, or not duplication, but certain um, veterans agencies appear um, multiple times throughout the course of a year. Perhaps, times. perhaps um, you could, if you're, if you're concerned that you don't have enough room um, to fit in some of the, some of the entities under that fall under cultural and recreational services, uh, maybe you could not call, maybe you could call some of the same, maybe you could call the, the individual Entities in at, at fewer parts of the year. I think also maybe some entities that we call and might be able to respond. We ask them for informational things that could actually come in the form of an email. Um, things such as that. So, but before we, before anybody even leaves, Social Service of Veterans Affairs, we're scheduling them again to come back. Or the, or, or the chair is, has them scheduled to come back in again in a couple of months or three months or who knows, maybe uh, six months. Um, and maybe there, maybe it could be a little redundancy. Um, I don't know. If, if I could speak to that point briefly, the 
um, the disposition and the and the agenda, um, Council of Barge has been, as Councilor Tacey and I can attest, has been very thorough about establishing in advance a full agenda. Um, if Council of Barge, but the next, if Council of Barge isn't on that committee, then uh, the committee is chaired by someone else, the disposition changes, and this is true of cultural affairs, because essentially, as Councilor Adams mentioned, we're, we're inviting, not requiring, nonprofits to come present before us. Um, is for informational purposes. In fact, actually, social services, first of all, we're required to have a veterans um, mm -hmm. committee uh, by Mass General Law, and uh, only required to convene once a year, as I recall. Social services back in the day when uh, 10, 12 years ago when we revised council committees, again, uh, social services actually evolved out of a review committee for CDBG grants. Um, all the participants, it used to be a citizens group and then some counselors. Those counselors then became enfolded into the uh, into this committee. And that uh, what Council of the Barge has done is called in a number of people who are traditional applicants for CDPG grants. If that authority is transferred over to Edlu, suddenly, oh, I'm sorry. No, go complete. I did, okay. Uh, yeah, oh, I th only, only partially. All the social service elements of CDBG will continue. Okay, so the projects, the sidewalks, and the and the and those things that go to Edlu, which is seems wholly appropriate. But the but the fact is is that so as what I'm trying to do is lay out essentially the historical evol evolvement of these committees, and the committee in the business that we do is basically established by the chair. And if you have a chair who who does not work as hard as Council of the Barge in this respect. You could actually ha end up with another committee that ends up like cultural affairs when there's no. Hey. Well, I <laughs> want to say there's, there's no agenda. There's He's no, almost out of here. Nothing. Right. I mean, I don't recall anything being referred out of <laughs> off this council floor to cultural affairs or to social services. I know there's never been a referral to my recollection to be deliberated and come back with it. So essentially, the counselors or the people who sit on those committees are the only people who are aware of the circumstances and the issues and the topics discussed. That doesn't ever, it doesn't expand back, it doesn't do what council committees should do in that respect because the council committees are to serve the council at large and expand its knowledge and improve its, its deliberative powers. And those committees don't do that, for better or for worse. That makes us smarter because we participate and we're very aware, but in fact I bet the three of us can recite chapter and verse charters for all the 501c3s in the city of Northampton that provide social services. But that doesn't serve the remainder of the body. And, and, um, and as such is not doing what it should do as, by my account anyway, what committees do. Holyoke, I don't know, they have what? They have like 18 counselors or something crazy. They, they have less committees than we do. In fact, actually, as I looked out throughout the region, Every deliberative body in the state practically has has substantially less committee meetings committees than we do. We uh, uh, and I always felt we never got enough credit for the amount of time that we devote and dedicate to to subcommittees and and, and and other groups. And they have changed over time, but their purpose they have to have a purpose. They have to have a distinct purpose that has relevance to this council. And and this is where and the, and I do appreciate. Councilor Adams, I actually asked him to do this, and, and like an idiot, he said yes. And I, I cannot tell you the amount of work that he's put in this is I am enormously grateful. And the reason I'd asked him was because of my concern of, uh, about the fact that some of our committees are not necessarily doing what we establish committees for. So to that extent, what we're doing in some sense is actually making bigger acronyms Community committees with bigger, longer acronyms. What would be S S V A C C C C C and and but the problem still stands. So that's my concern. Councilor Tacey. I think 
But sometimes we have we have like tapestry comes in several times in a year. No, they come in once. Well, we've had um, uh, service nut and tapestry and, and so they come in. Service nut comes in once a year. Council, you've been on you've been on the committee for four for four years, so it feels like it, it maybe it feels that way. <laughs> and and uh, uh, but just to to move the process. Yes. Are, are, I just want to see where the rest of the council is in terms of it seems like the discussion is focused around one, one piece of this. Are we in agreement? Are there controversies around the other issues, wrapping appointments into ordinance um, or the other suggestions that were made? Or is this the one, is this the one sticking point? I'm just, for me, uh, this seems to be the one place, those, but I just yeah, want to get the, the, the other, sense of the rest of the council. Refer to actually have stuff referred to them and then get referred back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, looking looking for efficiencies, it seems to me that the committees, they, they're productive as far as the, the need that they fill. And the fact is that it's actually it's actually just a um, uh, it's a it's a privilege that the mayor asks the council to help review um, CDBG grants. It is completely within the mayor's authority to assign CDBG money. And but so it's a privilege that we have, and we, and we have a process to review it. Um, I think that splitting the process a little bit is helpful, no, I, and I also think that the, they do good work. But I, I think that um, all, at the end of the day, it's a privilege that, that um, and, and that uh, these, uh, some of these organizations um, they're not compelled to come before them. So I, can, the, can the, just, the, drop, the, the, pay, the workload could drop dramatically. Right. I just want to go back to my more general statement, which is we're back to, is, is this the one area? I, I'm the second oldest, and so I get tired. I'm not the oldest, so I wouldn't be the one to uh, convene the meeting. But I'm just wondering if we agreed on all of this except for this one place, which I also agree uh, that, uh, that I think separating the CB. But are we? Are there other areas of contention? Just so we can kind of wrap our hands around, he, Councilor Adams has presented a, a, a number of things, and is this the one area that's kind of holding us up from moving forward and saying, "Good job, great, we approve it." Consultation. I'm ready to move forward on it as it as is written. Okay. I'll call the question. I am too. Yep. All right. Uh, the question's been called. Yes, I. With the amendment? As amended. Yeah. As, As amended. amended. With the name amended. amended. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Carney? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Arch? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Yes. Uh, that passes. <laughs> In first reading. Um, all right. Move item 12. Item 12 is moved. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion, please. Yes. Uh, Councilor Murphy. And this is one I had a question about because when it left the ordinance, we wanted to double check with the solicitor because there was a discussion in the ordinance. There might have been a, a, a separations of hours issue did the solicitor weigh in on it no what yeah. um, I'll say what I said at ordinance which I know <laughs> you heard it but I'll just repeat it for everyone um, this is this is basically taken word for word out of the charter uh, and uh, we had a um, the solicitor and I had a conversation over email uh, and on the phone um, back uh, over a year ago when we were talking about um, revising the Culture and Recreation Committee. Um, and um, this was the exact issue that um, Councilor Murphy brought up. And he, uh, he agreed with me um, that uh, this was at a phone conversation, but then he later sent an email that said, proceed. He agreed that um, a power of the council can be delegated to a committee, which is, I think, so that's the, the fundamental basis of, of a committee, right, is that you delegate a power to it. To it. So he agreed that this power can be delegated. Um, it's the basis of all the other committees that we just adopted. 
Uh, so I, I hope, and and so I hope that the technical issue is, um, is uh, is should be put. To, I it could be put to bed, and we still have a couple of weeks before second reading, so we can we can wait on that. Mm -hmm. The other reason, just the reason for this, it, Councilor uh, President Dwight was uh, talking about how we have so many committees, and now you're kill you were killing me because I want I want I would, my suggestion is to add a committee, right? Uh, but we just did uh, get rid of. Uh, not get merged too, so you know this is a uh, quality, not quantity, that I was going to. Uh, well, you weren't saying that, but uh, <laughs> but the idea here is that um, is that uh, we often we had a, actually a debate about uh, who was going to plan the um, downtown forum that we still haven't planned, uh, and that's mostly my fault. And um, uh, we also have information requests that the com that the full council may want to refer to a committee. Um, and uh, discussion of resolutions. Um, sometimes we don't have a place to refer them to. Um, they come up, and uh, sometimes we want to have a, a discussion about them or a forum about them, and we don't have a we don't have an immediate place to, to handle that. And so my suggestion was to in create this committee. Um, the committee meets mostly at the at the at the pleasure of the council. When the council refers something to it, it meets. It does not have a standing meeting, um, so I I don't think this is adding too much to the workload. Uh, and I do think that it can serve some purposes for um, for public outreach and for public communications and discussions, and also um, best practices. I have a, then I have because I'm I'm comfortable with the fact that you know we can get the solicitor to weigh in on this before second reading. Um, I did have the question you just brought up, which was creating another committee when we're trying to consolidate them, because this committee only takes action when the full council sends it something. So we appoint it, but it doesn't do anything unless the council says, do this. Um, but it's an appointed committee. And uh, philosophically, would it make more sense to have it be in, you know, if, if the council wants to do that, would it make more sense making it, you know, as an ad hoc committee gets appointed by issue, given the skill sets of various counselors. I mean, if it's, you know, if it if the council wants to look into something that is relative to an issue, the, the council president might go, I'd recommend this counselor, that counselor, and that counselor, because they have a particular skill set in that area, form that committee. Uh, and it could be a totally different committee for something else the council wants to look into to serve the same function, rather than having three or four counselors appointed to a committee that's like a catch-all for whatever may come along, that's where it has to go. Uh, just, just a thought. I mean, I, I understand the concept behind this committee, but if, if the council wants to look into anything, it can certainly create an ad hoc committee and, and, and assign counselors based on their skill sets to, to deal with it. You know, education might be one group and public works might be another. Councilor Spector, then Councilor Adams, then Councilor. That sounds like a good idea. It sounds like one I'd support. What what I what I might do and encourage others to do is I might vote for this in first reading and say yes, but have a little more time to think through the ad hoc thing, just kind of to yeah. let it sit a little bit rather than not vote this at all tonight, but to continue the conversation. So I think I would support this in first reading, but that sounds like a good idea. I just want to think there might be some pieces of that that don't make sense. It might make more sense to have it be a standing committee, but. Councilor Adams. But then uh, do you mind yeah, Council LeBar just in spoken? Yeah, no, I think I think it makes perfect sense. Um, but I think it's against our council rules. The council rules state that the council president assigns um, members of council members to all the committees and I don't know of any exception to that. So the council president could I'm sorry. Can I ask a direct it, question? It's a point of information. Are you saying that the council rules would not allow the council president to make <coughs> appointments to an ad hoc committee? Not that it can't make the appointments to an ad hoc committee, but this this is, um, I mean, this is a standing committee. But but I'm saying it's if, a stand. It's a stand. Going back to Councilor Murphy's recommendation, are you saying that that would not um, fit into the council rules? Council Murphy is saying it could become an ad hoc committee that the council president then appoints people by issue. And are you? I just want to clarify that. Are you saying that's not allowed by the council? Um, I, you know, I I think I think it might take a redrafting. Okay. Can I just say, uh, you can reverse it, actually, to go the other way. It's, it's actually, I think you're right, but for a different reason. Um, and this is why I support it in principle, but I 
just what I would keep going with this because, um, and this was what I'm going to say, so I'm skipping you, Councillor. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the council president can appoint councillors at any time. So what's, what's in, you could actually have this as a standing committee, but every time there's a referral, the council president picks the councillors who are going to be on it. Because um, uh, according to our rules, as so far as I know, the council president can assign uh, councillors to committees midterm. Can take one out of one and put one. I mean, that's something that the council president would hopefully not exercise if, for political reasons, but uh, could. And so you could do the same thing with this one. <laughs> what opportunity lost? Councillor Council Labarge, Councillor Casey. But you could just appoint a standing committee, but you would have to have a particular day of the month that it would meet, and then it would have to be like we get cards from the conference committee. You know. This meeting is canceled, or, or they're due to the lack of agenda items, and this just is, this is written as not. Isn't this written as? Yeah, not I'm not sure you have to have a. a, a doesn't as not yeah. have a specific. Not having a specific date. Council Mark. No, because uh, we often, when when I was on appointments, you know, we'd move the meeting around sometimes based on when the applicants were available. Yeah. So you know, I, I think the flexibility is there. Yeah. I, after reading the rule, I don't. I, I I guess I agree. I don't think it's as rigid as I thought I, I don't I just don't see it like that now I, I like I mean I th this really is an ad hoc committee in the in many respects but the only thing I would say against it is that um, s sometimes when you start to say oh well okay well in order to do this we have to create an ad hoc committee everyone's eyes roll back in their heads and so on so I would say pass this and let it and let it be a vessel and then when you have issues the, pre the president assigns people to them um, according to their interests or skill sets or what have you, and then that, that issue's done. The council becomes a ghost council, basically. But keep it in the orders. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, committee. I committee. Uh, excuse committee. me, yes. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> that basically makes it ad hoc, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't create this extra barrier to, because um, then if it's an ad hoc committee, someone has to draft the ad hoc committee element. You have to draft the committee and so on and so forth. Oh, I, I think that's a good point. It's a, yeah, if it's a standing committee with unassigned, that's unassigned yeah. yes. and gets assigned as needed. Yes. I like that. The issue. It's an empty vessel. It's until a ghost. 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 Okay. I feel like an empty vessel. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to move the question. Question's been moved. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay. Oh, uh, thank you, Councillor Adams. <laughs> I didn't thank you for the last one. <coughs> can we? Uh, can we? Can we move these as a group? Can we move fourteen to thirty as a group? Well, yeah. We're not there yet. We're, oh, we're not. We're, well, we got thirteen. Today. We got number thirteen. It's kind of a big one in some respects. So. This is to amend 22 2 through 22 8, the council, <coughs> the council committees uh, from August 15, 2013, table to December. Uh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, table to December 5th, 2013. Second. Discussion. Council Murphy. Oh, and the, the reason I think we wanted to delay all of these till this month was we didn't want to upset the apple cart for all the sitting committees. So we figured first reading tonight second reading at our last meeting of the year, it doesn't reorganize committees mid-session. So that, that's the reason we did the delay. Of the gotcha. It was yep. just to, to, to have this take effect. This is deleting all the council committees. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's, that's why it was significant. We shouldn't pass I it see. over. Because so now we have no more committees yet. After, after, after the second reading. reading. After the second okay. reading. Okay. 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 Unless you want to do two readings okay. tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's options available. Uh, I'd like to move this question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, did you move the question? I'll move the question. Yeah. Second. second. Questions been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Aye. Council Labarge? Yes. Council Yes. 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 Does anyone suspend rules now? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can we move, Mr. President? Yeah. No? Can, can uh, I actually, can I make yes. a suggestion? Uh, move 14 through 30, except number 29. 
I was going to request removing uh, number 24 as well. And 24. Okay. Yeah. 29 and 24, so we're moving the group 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27, 28, 30. Correct? So yes. moved. All right. Second. Okay, it's, it, we're just pulling out uh, 24 and 29. The town crier and uh, the commissions and committees. Any discussion on these? Uh, roll call, please. Who's next? I think I am. Councilor Barge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. <coughs> yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Freeman? Aye. All right, so we'll go to number 24, which is the establishment appointment of a town crier. Um, move a uh, oh, motion. Second. 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 Um, I've I got an interesting history lesson today about this. I thought it was this, this quaint antiquity that sat here forever from the original charter of the community. It was actually established in 1986 as somewhat of a promotional gimmick. Um, the gentleman who became the town crier um, left under dubious circumstances. Left under very dubious circumstances. And the, and the city also provided him with knickers, a puppy <laughs> shirt, and a felt. Three, four, <laughs> right, four, um, where, where, where's the puppy shirt now? I'd, he took off. Probably, he went to jail with it. <laughs> 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 so, I'd be willing to extend the so, meeting to find out the story. Yeah, but, I, <laughs> information request. <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> My concern is, is that this actually, uh, we don't have any applicants for town crier. We actually have no need for town crier. Um, the, um, we have actually any number of citizens who serve as town criers, as de facto town criers. Um, I think keeping something in because it's cute is not a good idea necessarily. And it also sets us up for uh, some potential embarrassment that we don't need to experience beyond the regular embarrassments that we have daily. So, so actually, I think when that came up, it was at that working group meeting that Councillor Adams missed, and we wanted to appoint him. Tim. Because <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't at the meeting. And he'd, and he'd look great in knickers and a puffy shirt. <laughs> we just didn't tell him so yet. Councillor, right, so yeah. you don't support You might not have read actually I'm, what it says. I'm recommending to save Councillor <laughs> Adams. That yeah. So you're saying delete? You remember we did? Delete. I do. 105 stroke one is that what you're saying I would like to I like to call the de for a deletion so that's an amendment to yes. this well no this is moved to the right, so we'll just yeah. yeah but it's an amendment well, actually to if we just don't pass that ordinance do, it, is it no so longer if we don't pass it? Well, fails then it's just gone then right? it's dead yeah right but I, so if it well, doesn't no, get wait, if it's no, wait, if it's not moved and seconded well it has been moved you I'm sorry moved oh I apologize <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Can I please yeah. point of information? Isn't this isn't the town crier already established in the in the ordinance? We're just deleting the appointment authority. Right. Yes. So if if we don't delete, if we if we vote against it, then it stays on the books. Right. The, the there books. So far as I can tell, there's two ways to fix this. The council uh, the council deletes this uh, bit of law entirely, or the mayor. Um, Pat, uh, submits an administrative order to the council that deletes it. Well, that, that basically deletes it. Yeah, that may be the better way to go, actually. In the yeah, with two time. readings yeah. next time or something. Yeah. Um, but I um, why is it can I just can I? Just I think that's better because the mayor um, the mayor ha has a has a signal um, no urgency to pass administrative to submit administrative orders um, and the. Last possible date is September. September 30th. So, um, if the council does it now, you're saving him yeah. the potential embarrassment of having to have someone in a tri corner hat <laughs> and knickers. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to, I, I see no reason if it's to go with the former solution and just have the council do it tonight. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. So how do you? So we're deleting. So, so could but we amend? Can we amend it? No, we can't. 
So we're making an amendment to delete it. it it's a friendly it. amendment. Right. Then. The amendment proposes the, 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 dele the, town the deletion yeah. of item 24, the ordinance. You can get what, do we have the actual text of it? Yeah, I'm looking for that. I kind of want to see uh, this. Yeah, here. It's in the chart. It's in the code of ordinances. This yeah, is an ordinance of the city of Northampton provide blah, 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 blah. Be it ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton, the city council assembled as follows the section 105-1 of the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton be amended to that uh, such section shall read as follows establishment appointment there shall be established the position of town crier to be appointed okay. by the mayor and what the language has been amended changes subject to confirmation by the city council to serve a term of three, mr uh, president three years may i um that's what's you know before us uh this is difficult because we have to waive rules but may i suggest that we uh vote I suggest we vote this down, uh, and then and then um, we, we we say we nay we 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 create a nay vote on this, and then at the December at our next meeting, we delete Chapter 105 in its entirety, and do two readings. And Mr. President, we need to vote on continuation of the meeting. It's a, it's 10:59. If we don't vote continuation, then we're going to be in a catch 22. All right. We can just end it. <laughs> uh, all right, in the middle of this right now, all I those in favor of suspending rules to extend the meeting beyond the uh, 11 o'clock, please. Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? All right. We live to, to work another day. Two. Do you have two no's or three? I said no. Three no's. Oh. Uh, oh no. No, you need to have, we're at the five, you need to have six yeses. All right, motion to reconsider. You have, you have to have six yeses to continue. Motion to reconsider. Okay. There's been a motion to reconsider. All those in favor of reconsideration, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. We're now reconsidering motion. There is a motion. There's a motion. Motion to suspend the rules. No, you don't have to vote on it. It's a motion. Motion to, motion to make suspend a motion to rules. Suspend the rules. Right. All right. And it's been seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. One day. Okay. So. All right. Do we know uh, what we're doing on this now. Mary also points out that if we vote this down, what, because we're this proposal is to amend the language, which allows subject to uh, uh, confirmation by the council. It. It doesn't matter. Good point. It's, uh, if we if if we delete the entire section next meeting. The only thing we have to risk is that someone applies for town crier between, between now, now and the next and meeting. The 19th. You're right. All right. Make a motion but to postpone this till the next meeting. Yeah, yeah, just postpone. Well, postpone it. Let's postpone it. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Fine. There's a motion until the next meeting. Postpone number 24. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We're doing 29, and then I'd actually like to add on new business, uh, Village Idiot, if we could. <laughs> and I apply. <laughs> um, number 29, this is uh, uh, this is 22-1 uh, through 22-11, commissions and committees. That's the first reading. Uh, I'll accept a motion, put it on. So uh, moved. Second. Mr. President. Council for Human Day. I'd like to amend this to um, to delete uh, sections 22.1 through 22.8, not delete 22.9, 22.10, uh, and uh, delete 22.11. Councilor, could you? Could I, but that's my motion. Yeah, that's my motion. I need I a second. second. Thank I second you. It. For purposes of discussion, or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, just not, just not delete 22.9, 22.10. So retain everything else. Yes, ma'am. You can't separate them? The, the, he's, he's proposing an amended, amendment to the deletions. So, Councilor Freeman Daniels, please. Uh, Mr. President, if we, uh, I think this was an oversight by um, the solicitor. If we delete the Board of Public Works City Council Conference Committee, and the city council school committee conference committee um, we have no method of of 
putting them back in place when the new council convenes. So in other words, those two committees, those two conference committees would cease to be, to exist. Um, and uh, I think that uh, they both served a valuable purpose for this council and for the city. So I hope that uh, the council would keep those two committees okay. until such time as the mayor reorganizes government. Uh, Council Murphy, did you have a comment? Now, wasn't the, the process of this just to take these things out of ordinances and make them orders? Yeah, but we can't. We we Make can't. I'm sorry. Keep, keep it's a flow of uh, business here. Yeah, uh, uh, Councilor Adams, I'm going to presume you raised your hand. So go ahead. Well, if, if um, we can't recreate some of these just by council rule, we don't have that authority. Um, and I don't. And I don't. And I don't think this came up during right. during the the, um, the ordinance review committee. But we can't. We can't create a multiple member body ourselves. We can only create council committees. And so we can't, we can't under the new yeah. charter, which we are under, we can't mandate, for example, the Board of Works to be part of our committees. They're not, they're part of the executive branch. Um, and the, the school committees, charter. yeah, yeah. And, this, and the school committee is an, in a complete independent entity. We can't mandate that they partake in any meetings with us outside of the charter. So I agree with the amendment, but. You know, we're also in here. There's also Transportation and Parking Commission, Commission Committee on Disabilities, Capital Improvements, Central Business Architecture, Community Preservation, Elm Street Historic District, Historic mm -hmm. District Commission, mm -hmm. Northampton Redevelopment Authority, and Zoning Board of Appeals, which I believe are all multi-member bodies too. So, How about including all of those in Council the Freeman Daniels. Um, so th this is a rather cumbersome uh, single ordinance amendment. Um, but uh, really what we're deleting out of it is the sort of the general preamble of the council's powers and the different committees that the, are primarily associated with the council. Um, that list that Councillor Adams just read off, to, uh, as far as I know, is um, explicitly stating that councillors can't serve on those multiple member bodies, which we know is the case um, in, uh, as, uh, by charter. Um, the uh, the part that uh, we're the part that I just that I am not separating out because it's kind of cumbersome is the um, the very beginning in section 22-1 where the uh, the council president is by law is given the the ability to assign counselors to um, 22 to uh, the board of public works conference committee and the school committee conference committee. But um, I believe that that right is included in the charter, so I don't think that it absolutely has to be in the, the code of ordinances. But we can get that clarified by the solicitor by next meeting. I think you should table this till the next meeting because there's many places in here where these committees are mentioned in different ways. Move to postpone. Okay. Yeah, that, that was going to be my suggestion that because this we don't have to do this. We can do two readings on this. Yeah. Uh, right. last meeting because none of this was supposed to take effect till then anyway so maybe rather than messing with the dna tonight at 11 o'clock we'll do we i'll second the motion to continue to our next meeting and we can make sure we got it right before we do it right so it Except doesn't matter to us all in favor table aye. 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 that brings us up to item number 31 and that's amend uh, chapter 16 4-6 and that's claims and this is upon the recommendation of Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts providing the code of move, ordinances. Move to refer to, or, to ordinance. Second it. Motion to be made and second to refer to ordinance. Is this, does you want to, uh, to this go to transportation and parking? Uh, Anyone else? Sure. Oh. And okay. Let's add transportation okay, so it's uh, the referral to transportation, parking, and ordinance. Um, uh, oh, no, no. Wait. Uh, okay, so there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, and a second. Oh, okay. So is there discussion on the referral? No discussion on the referral? Mm -hmm. All those in favor of referring, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, let's see, updates. Uh, we, we've signed up for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was one. <coughs> I'm sorry? First night. Uh, 
No. Yeah. Well, those are my, those are second yeah. Um. I, as far as I can tell, I have nothing else to to. Uh, is there any information requests? We've got one more meeting. No more any new business? I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.